Right, okay guys, welcome to another video of mine's. Um, we have quite literally been here for about an hour trying to get this thing to work. Before I start, I was trying to use Google Hangouts um, to record this, and I can't get it working. The big button that uh, says record seems to have vanished. I don't know whether I'm doing something wrong, quite possible. But anyway, let me introduce, uh, if you watch my channel, I dare say you know this rather hairy beast that's behind the camera, and I'm not talking about myself. <laughs> it's Mr. Lacosa or Chris. What would you rather be called? Uh, oh, either works. Uh, it, either it, it, it's all good. Like myself, you've probably been called far worse. Eh? Oh, far worse, yeah. <laughs> now, if you've clicked, well, obviously you've clicked on the video, you'll see we are about to, uh, it's probably the, a question that's been asked over the years. What are not just the top 10, but the top 20 worst games ever? Now Chris and I are going to unravel these and we are going to present to you the top 20 worst video games ever, bar none. Now, we, we spent about, I don't know, half an hour, Chris, was it, I think? Uh, something like that, yes. Pulling together, I mean, we had a, a list of about 79 games and we've yeah. managed to whittle it down, uh, down to 20. And believe you me, it almost came to blows trying to determine who was going to get what game in and what was going to take the number one spot yeah it was it was hard enough going to get down to 20 of them <laughs> so what we've done is uh now i know this this uh this list might be slightly biased towards the c64 and it's probably because i'm a c64 man as is yourself chris yeah yeah um it's it's the computer that uh, i just look back on the most it's i had more games for that than any other, I didn't really play uh, you know, Spectrum games that often, didn't play Amstrad games at all, so 64 is, is the one I really focus on. Yeah, I, I would imagine if uh, if we'd featured the Spectrum or the Amstrad, it would have probably filled up the majority of the 20 games. Uh, they could well have done, yeah. I'm only kidding, I'm only kidding, I do actually love the Spectrum, I love the Spectrum, not quite so much the Amstrad, but that's uh, that's for another day. Um, so yeah, what we're going to do is we're just going to we're going to do it in reverse order, starting at number twenty. Um, some of these games Chris isn't familiar with, and vice versa. I'm not familiar with some of them. So we're going to take it in turns to kind of debate the the virtues and the pluses and the cons of each game. And well, that we're also lack gonna, thereof. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm also going to do is I'm going to put a little thumbnail down below of a uh, said game getting played. So to kick off in number twenty position is. It's one of it's a game that's quite it's it's a special place in my heart and it's Crazy Kong by Interceptor Software. Um, where to start with this game? Firstly, the graphics are just quite frankly atrocious. What I suggest you do, Chris, is maybe bring it up. Crazy Kong uh, by Interceptor Software in the C sixty four. It was obviously it was a, a clone of Donkey Kong. Um, why is it in this list? The playability is diabolical. Trying to navigate, it, I mean, when you move the joystick left or right, the wee guy just moves away. Um, it, trying to get him to go up a ladder is nigh on impossible. But the absolutely quintessential deal breaker for this game is when you pick up the hammer, it is completely random as to how long the hammer lasts. I mean, I think in Donkey Kong, I don't know, I think there is a bit of randomness that goes on with Donkey Kong. But generally, you've maybe got 20 seconds. You can usually think, right, I better, I better kind of expect the hammer to disappear. In this particular game, you can quite literally have the hammer for a minute and then you think to yourself, you're beauty. And also, what they've also done, maybe this is their own spin in the game, you can also climb ladders with the hammer. Now, any Donkey Kong aficionado would know that you simply can't do that. But that's, that's not going to break a game. But the fact is, you could be running and suddenly the hammer will disappear and you'd simply explode. The main sprite, I don't know if you're looking at the, the game, Chris. It's, uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's oh. you, if I remember from memory, the main sprite, it looks more like a spaceship. You're like a little block with two little blocks for legs. And it's it just makes this funny sound when you're running. Um, yeah. You can see there, it's a, it's a god awful game. Um, but like I said, it's got a special place in my heart. But as far as a fun game to play, it is atrocious. I don't know who designed the graphics. It's a classic Interceptor game. In fact, I'm very very surprised that I think that Interceptor. Uh, this is the only title 
from Interceptor Software we've actually got in this list, which means these next 19 must be awful. So for number 20, we've got Crazy Kong by Interceptor Software. Number 19, Chris, is Armalite by the Com- by the Commodore Amiga on the Commodore Amiga. I'll let you yeah. talk the viewers. I'll let you talk the viewers through this one. Why Armalite on the Amiga? Right. Um. I mean, okay, Commodore 64 version of Armalite. I'm not a big fan of, but it's it's hugely popular. Uh, it's it had a pretty unique um, power up system, which was, I think one of the big reasons why it was so popular um audio wise it was great uh graphic wise it was great i just couldn't get on get on with it at all then the amiga version came along and um you get the impression that uh arc developments who made it because they also did r type uh they weren't too keen on the power-up system just like i wasn't Trouble is, you also get the impression that they didn't like uh, the the visuals, or the audio, or the gameplay because they changed every single aspect of it, and it was completely unrecognisable as uh, the the same game. Apart from the title, that was it. Um, the game itself is ludicrously hard. I know people who are uh, shoot them up aficionados absolute experts at it they can't get anywhere um i did a review of it and i had five goes of it i tacked these on at the end i had five goes and it didn't even last two minutes all five goes combined that's not just because of how crap i am at playing the thing that's how difficult it is it looks awful Uh, graphically I've seen public domain games look better. Of course, this thing was 25 quid. So it looked awful. Uh, the great uh, music from the 64 version has been replaced with an ultra generic, uh, <laughs> well, soundtrack, uh, which it, it just doesn't suit it at all. Uh, everything about it, it's. It's almost as if they thought, right, well, the 64 version is great. Let's not even attempt to uh, try and emulate it for the, the uh, Amiga. We can't do it, so we're not going to bother. It plays worse than it looks, worse than it sounds. It's, it's just <coughs> horrendous. I'll be honest, I'm looking at it here, Chris, and I'm, almost, I'm not playing it, I'm not listening to it. It looks pretty good. The graphics look nice. Is it, is it misleading? It is misleading. You look at the uh, uh, the visuals on the 64 version, and then you look at them on the uh, Amiga one. They're two completely different games. So people who buy or who bought Armalite uh, back in the day knew what the uh, you know visually what it was going to look like, and this Amiga version just didn't look it at all. It, it was just. Yeah, it's just a, a completely different game. If they called it anything other than Armalite, they might have got away with it. Mm-hmm. It's interesting because obviously the, the C64 version is probably one of the sort of the, the most fondly remembered. Probably some people say it's probably one of the most technically accomplished games on the system. And yet for its big brother, which technically has got better graphics, uh, better sound capabilities, why was it so awful? I, I just don't think they put any effort into it. I mean, Thalamus were pretty infamous with it. Their, their Amiga versions of uh, 64 games were always terrible. I mean, Hawkeye could have quite deservedly got a spot on here. <laughs> um, so I, I, I just don't think they had anyone there who could program an Amiga, uh, well, at all well. What, it's what, almost like they didn't try. Yeah, what what would you say? What would you say was why is this on the list? Is it just the playability? Just yeah, difficult? it is staggeringly difficult. It's also extremely annoying because you effectively have to sit there and wait for the entire game to load each time you're starting a, another go. So you're sitting there for 
well, say like a minute and a half waiting to actually play the game. You're playing the game for all of about 20 seconds, and then you've got another sort of like minute and a half waiting just to actually start the game again. So it's really slow. It, it's been badly coded in, in that regard. And after you try it about three times, you just think, oh, I've had enough of that, and probably never loaded it again. <laughs> Well, what I'm going to do is, you know, I've got a, I've got a feature where I look at different shoot 'em ups. I am going to play this game and just put it to the test. <laughs> well, uh, all I say, is good luck to you <laughs> on that. Yeah. And I've not got the greatest game in skulls, so really, because the game is just so. I mean, that is what one thing about one thing we've got to say, guys, about the games in this list. There are some of the some of the games that we've included in this list are probably beautiful looking games, you know, which we'll go over, but I and. A game, a game has got to be enjoyable. That's the first and foremost. It's got to be enjoyable. It's got to be playable. Yeah. You know, there's games that we could have included in this list, like Shadow of the Beast, which yeah. it was a showcase for the Commodore Amiga. The graphics were astounding. The sound was even better. But that somebody had completely. I always, I always think it's like you. They say, right, guys, we've got a uh, tomorrow night. We're going to be releasing the game. Right, how are we doing? Have you done the graphics? Yep. Oh, fantastic, brilliant. Sound? Excellent, yep. Controls spot on. Gameplay? Gameplay? Anybody? Oh, shit. <laughs> Just yeah. it. Put, put it out there. <laughs> Just I mean, a, a lot of people game. complain, I think, rightly about modern games where they're all about how it looks and how it sounds and the gameplay can be afterthought. Ah. I mean, things like Shadow of the Beast and Armalite here they were the games that really, I think, started that trend, which yeah. is still carrying on today. To be honest, a lot, a lot of the, and again, like I said, we could probably do another one of these videos purely based on early 16-bit um, games. Some of the early, early games on the 16-bit machines by, what was the name of the company? Um, oh, blimey. Is it Lothiel, Lothiel or something they were called? Oh, like, yeah. They did like Captain Blood and all these sort of stuff. There were some atrocious racing games that were bloody awful. Oh, I mean, Captain Blood was a great game. But, <laughs> Captain uh... Blood was actually all right. That was a bad example. Um, it had the kind of fractal graphics, but anyway, we're kind of deviating slightly from the list. But anyway, so to summarise, why is Armalite on the list? Uh, because it's an insult to the Commodore 64 version. It, it bears no resemblance to it, and the, and the difficulty level is ridiculous. Right, number 18 in the list, and I'll, I'll kind of pick the banner up for this one, but I think it's a game you're probably familiar with as well, Chris, and it's a game that I have featured on multiple ver sort of videos. The last V8 by, <laughs> was it Mastertronic, I think it was? Yeah, it was on the Mad label, wasn't it, for uh, Mastertronic? On the Commodore 64. Now, I can't... What was... What was it? Mad something added dimension? Yeah, Mastertronic added dimension. Added it, mad dimension. Games. I don't know what the dimension was, but it was added anyway. <laughs> in, in, in the case of this one, I don't think anybody yeah, knows. Yeah. Now, it was, as, as we've all, we're all familiar with, I was going to say pocket money. See, I was, I was, I was working. I was a full-time worker at that point. It wasn't pocket money. I bought all my own games, but, you know, you, you had enough money saved up. You went up to buy a game. You picked up the box. You looked at the back. You thought, wow, that looks awesome. And that game was one of them. Um, got home, loaded it up, was literally blown away with the, the music. Rob, I can never see his name probably, Rob Hubbard. Um, stunning soundtrack. It was programmed by Richard Darling, one of the uh, founders of Codemasters. Yeah, the Codemasters, yeah. yeah. Um, how it's going to be awesome. Now, as you can see from the thumbnail at the bottom, the first thing about it is the game... I'm just going to load it up actually myself so I can see it when I'm actually talking. Yeah, the top of the screen, quite literally, is it the top third, I think it is, Chris? I, I'm not even sure it's as much as a, a yeah, third. It, it's like a quarter of the screen. Let's have a, let's just have a wee look. Uh, the last V8. Yeah, the top third of the screen is literally a title. It's a title um, for the game. Actually, I think yeah, the, the banner is at uh, the bottom of the screen. It's one of my biggest pet hates in gaming. 
when they have to keep the title and who it's by on display the whole time. So I know what it's called. I've just <laughs> bought the thing. I had to stop myself. <laughs> <laughs> Aye, I mean, it's. I, I don't know if anybody, um, if anybody is uh, familiar. I can't even find the game on 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 uh, YouTube. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, if anybody. Was that the game there? No, it's not. If anybody is familiar with, uh, is there a reason why right why Richard Darling chose to only use a third of the screen? Was it to keep the speed up or something? I I really do have no idea. Um, I think it's just really bad uh, visual design. And so we so we have that banner there. Half the screen is taken up with you know the stateless panel and the info panel which could easily have been compacted down to using far less uh, you know, the real yeah. estate. Yeah. Um, so why on earth he did that? I think this game came out... Did it come out after Blue Max? I don't know if you're familiar with that one. Blue... That, was, that a, was that a driving game as well? Actually, not Blue Max. Red Max. Oh, that was it. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, that yeah. was another driving game. And it looks i mean it was by uh richard darling or was it david darling one of them um it looks identical to uh the last v8 right down to where uh, with the commodore 128 version of last v8 which i also covered that had an extra level at the uh at the start so it had a completely different level one and that is <laughs> just the first level of uh, red max so they just incorporated that in the 128 version. So it is absolutely identical. And I'm just wondering if he just took all the attributes and assets from that, put it into this new one, gave it a different uh, uh, soundtrack, gave it a decent Rob Hubbard soundtrack, the one good thing about the game, and packaged that, and there we go. New game. That's $2.99, yeah, please. I suppose, possibly, yeah. I mean, there it, in fact, there it's, there it's there, I know. Obviously, the viewers can see the viewers can see the actual screen, the game on screen. But I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that there? Yeah. Yeah. So there we go. Uh, yeah. I mean, basically, yeah, there we the, go. the top, the top, yeah, the top third of the screen is the gameplay area. Then the middle third is it shows you the time, etc., your speed, and then at the very, very bottom, you've got a huge, big, humongous the V8. Last V8, created by Richard, David Darling, I beg your pardon, it was David Darling. Um, why was that? I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that just exactly what you're saying, Chris, it was possibly part of laziness. I don't know. Um, we're, we're maybe being unfairly critical, but I have played oh, games. I don't think it's unfair at all with this one. <laughs> uh, I have, we have played games. I've played games that are very similar. There's a fantastic game, which uh, Speedway, Rally Speedway, it's an old American game. Very similar Double. to this full screen, so I'm sorry, uh, David, but I think uh, I think in this one, mate, you've been caught out. <laughs> now this game does get I I have criticised this game in the past. In fact, we've not even touched on why the game is on this list. It's not so much that the top you've only got a third of the screen, the play area. It's the fact that it's just so damn difficult. It's it's a combination of. I mean, you just have to brush against anything at all and your car explodes Excellent. and you only get one life. Yeah. But also, they they made the car just utterly uncontrollable. Trying to just do something as simple as go around, uh, uh, there's a like, U part very early on um, as you're starting the level. Trying to get around that, you, you just can't do it. The, the control method that they've, implemented with it is either the worst i've seen in any driving game ever i think if i remember from memory have you got to press it up to move forwards well what, what, it, what it is uh you, you you move the joystick in the direction you want to go and then the car will accelerate there but no matter what direction you're going if you want to slow down you have to move it in the opposite direction so if you're going at a diagonal so you're going, you know, top left. You've got to move it uh, bottom right to be able to slow down. But then turning... <laughs> 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 you've got to turn it 
in a 90 degree angle to whichever direction the car is traveling in to be able to turn left or right. Oh, it's just, it drives you around the bend. <laughs> I mean, well, I've, I've, I wish it I'd, had drive you around the bend, mate. Well, it does, <laughs> the does, does it in completely the wrong way. I mean, I had this game, what is it? I mean, I, it came out in 85, I think, didn't it? And I, do, yeah. I think I got it in, I think, yes, it was 85 when I got it. So I've had this game for 34 years, and I have never even been able to get halfway through the first level. It's utterly ludicrous. Uh, the thing is, the frustrating part for me is it still looks like a beautiful game. Possibly, would it have been worth, was it £2.99? Yeah, £2.99, yeah. Because had added dimension. I don't, know, I don't know if £2.99 was worth it just for a Rob, Rob Hubbard track. I'm not convinced. It, I think it would have been if the track had been a bit longer. It's not one of his longer, uh, longest pieces. It's only a couple of minutes long. Yeah. If it had been, say, as long as, like, his music in Arcade Classics or uh, International or Karate, yeah. Yeah. I mean, then, yeah, it would have been worth right. three quid. You know what? Again, there'll probably be people who'll be watching this video thinking, these guys haven't got a clue what they're talking about. And you're probably <laughs> absolutely right, because this is only our opinion. It's only our opinion. Maybe we're crusty old guys that can't play games, but I was 17 years old when I got the game, and I couldn't play it even back then. Um it's if it had just had a slight bit tweaking perhaps if they had uh, and this is one of my pet hates with driving games if they had made it well you're driving left to right so yeah left and right in the joystick would control where you're going fire button throttles it would have probably been marginally more playable well it certainly can't be any less playable aye, than it aye, is aye. or it might have made the game it wouldn't have been on this list. It might have been on one of the best budget games ever. I don't know. Um, I, I think that's a bit of a stretch. Uh, I mean, it certainly could have been a lot better than it is. There's no doubt about that. But uh, releasing it in this state, Broken that was game not a good idea. Yeah. Like I said, I, I did get one particular person that said I was completely, a, I was a fool to make these comments because he's completed it loads of time. And I dare say, like a lot of games, Perseverance will win at the end of the day, but... You know, I wasn't prepared to put that much effort in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, you have to persevere, but the game just doesn't... Oh, there, so there's there's no compulsion to try. The reason I've got this last V8 game on the list is tiny screen, broken game. And that's why it's uh, featured at number 18 on our list. Next one, Chris, I'll let you talk through this one, mate. It is Barbarian by Psygnosis. <laughs> Software right. on the Amiga. Right. Now... Well, this is uh, an interesting one that I've uh, been given because, okay, I'm not exactly a big fan of it, but I wouldn't go so far as to say I absolutely hate it. Um, I mean, this was one of the earliest uh, Psygnosis releases for the Amiga, wasn't it? I think this came out in 87. Can I say it? I bought this? This was one of the first games I bought on Atari ST, and it was, I saw that, I looked at the box art, and I thought, wow. That, uh, yeah, Incredible. that was a mistake everyone made. And it does they look they saw yeah. exactly, they saw how it looked, saw the box art, saw the screenshots. Thought, right, I've got to get that. And um, I, I actually got this on a compilation. I can't remember what the other games that came with it were, but I mean, it doesn't matter. Um, but I'd already played the ST version, which makes it even more ridiculous that I bought this thing because I'd already played it. I knew what it was like <laughs> and I still went out and got the Amiga version anyway. Um, I mean, yeah, visually it, it looks great. And, uh, okay, a lot of it is played in total silence, but what sound effects there are, especially when you consider this was an 87 release. I mean, yeah. the sound effects and, and uh, the visuals were amazing. But the gameplay just did not work at all the whole thing is controlled by a series of icons across uh, the bottom of the screen uh, i'm sure there's a uh, uh, a thumbnail of it running now but um you had to well firstly you had to take into account that if you clicked on an icon to get you to do a certain action there was a good two three second delay before we actually <laughs> did it so you had to be spot on with your timing by making sure you did everything you know 
a lot sooner than it was actually going to appear on the screen anyway. So the timing was completely thrown apart. It was a bit of a memory game, wasn't it? You had to have played it. Like, I know when I go into this screen, I think, if I remember rightly, the scrolling was bloody awful as well. Well, it was effectively a flip screen game. Wasn't it? Ah, you got to the end of the screen, then it would suddenly all shoot across uh -huh. and, and you're on the next one. And a lot of the time, even before uh, the next screen actually appeared, um, there was some enemy creature on there which had already killed you. And uh, oh. so, so it was one of the most frustrating games to play. And it was purely down to this awful icon driven uh, control system they implemented yeah. on it it's like they couldn't off i mean i think you say that the game graphically wise it was beautiful yeah the animation wasn't the best but it was the fact that they couldn't whoever decided let's make a fighting platformer mouse controlled with icons yeah. it's like playing can you imagine playing kung fu master using a mouse and icons yeah it's just ridiculous I... I have a feeling that the reason they went with uh, uh, the mouse control was because the Amiga was still very new and the, yeah. the Atari ST was very new. So using a mouse was a, a novelty, you know, hardly anybody had used one uh, then because you know, we all had Commodore 64s and Spectrums. So, okay, you could get mice for them, but hardly anyone had one. So it was okay, so right, we've got this new control uh, uh, you know, new controller, new mouse here, right, we'll make sure you use that to play the game. And the, guy, the cool. guys went, but it's going to be shit. Yeah. The kids are going to love this. It uses, it uses a mouse. <laughs> and they, I, they went one stage further with the next release when they released Terrapods. I don't know if you uh, played <laughs> that one. I'm familiar with Terrapods, actually, uh, yeah. Uh, mouse, joystick, and keys to control one game. It was basically right. Let's just throw everything in there and and make it completely unplayable again. Uh, again, barbarian. If I remember rightly, you could control. You could move them left and right with a joystick. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. You use could the joystick press the for fire that. button to do the action, but you still had to use the mouse to jump, and you still had to use the mouse to run away. And uh, yeah, and, and yeah, I mean. It's not going to be a spoiler alert because nobody in the right mind is going to play the game. But there were some bits where he would be running off screen and it would suddenly flip it and you knew that if you kept running you were going to get crushed by a boulder and you're frantically trying to press the stop button and he just runs headlong into the boulder. Boom, game it over. Keeps on going, yeah. <laughs> so, to sum up, Chris, why is Barbarian by Psygnosis on the list? Uh, because it is one of the most unplayable games ever released. It, it, it had potential and then they completely crippled it with this awful control system. Yeah, yeah. If you think about it, if they'd made it purely joystick controlled, it could have been an absolute cracking game. Yeah, and it was... If you see the game running, you could see they could easily have made it purely a joystick uh, controlled game. Yeah. But for some see, reason, didn't. I think they've... Uh, They've, they've put the, the mouse control in just because they can. Yeah, because it was the novelty at the yeah. time. So. Yeah. so that is number 17. That is Barbarian on the Commodore Amiga. This next one, is, this is going to be a quick one to talk about, and it's called Squidge on the ZX Spectrum. I think it also came out in the Commodore 64, but I think it in particular is the Spectrum one we're going to talk about. It's quite a... Not a famous game, but a lot of people mention this game. It An infamous in game. Yeah, I don't know who, I have no idea who actually released the game. The reason it is on this list is because it is unplayable. Completely. I mean, I've been spared the honour of ever actually uh, playing it, but I've seen videos of it, and that was an. I didn't even know there was a Commodore 64 version of it released, but uh, yeah, I've been spared that uh, honour. But uh, it's got to be one of the slowest running games I've ever seen. And, you know, I mean, it makes Freescape games look uh, lightning fast, for crying out loud. <laughs> but to, 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 can you, uh, to explain a bit more about why it's on this list, the movement, the, 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 the way you control, I, I should really, you know what, I should really be bringing a video up rather than just talking out a hole in my backside. Basically, the reason it's on the list is because the programmer, now I don't know why he did this, when he was uh, 
before he released the game, he apparently put a poke into the game, which actually rendered the main character unmovable. <laughs> so you you quite quite literally could not control the game. So you loaded it up. That was it. That was as far as you were going to get to go. Um, now there is Kim Justice has done a, quite a, an in depth uh, video all about the game. Go and check it out. She does a cracking uh, explanation. But yeah, literally, you've got to ask yourself, how did this game ever get to publication? Yeah, I've heard some people actually justify uh, the release of this with, um, well, the explanation they give is it gave you the chance to uh, check the uh, programming and alter it yourself. Well, I don't think you could actually break into the code and get the listing up. So there weren't going to be that many people who are able to actually do that in the first place. And why would you buy a game purely so that you could do that? So you, you had to have some sort of basic knowledge of assembly or disassembler uh, and then be able to go through the actual like code of the game just in order to make the bloody thing work i, I believe yeah i believe uh, somebody has uh, somebody has actually gone in and uh, put out a bug free version uh, apparently it's a poke it's a poke but you actually tell me that they tried to advertise the game as it's, it's a, a means to learn how to program well it, it, it wasn't advertised as such but I've heard people justify uh, and say that the game isn't that bad, and that was the reason they gave. I'm thinking you have got to be pretty desperate to look for a reason, or you know, look for something good in a game if that's all you can come up with <laughs> for this thing. The thing is, this was a commercial release, and you know how on earth it got it got past the beta testers is beyond me. I mean, I'd be interested to know, I mean, again, go and watch uh, Kim's uh, video. I'd be interested to know if people were actually given... See, see, um, see when you think about it, and I, I think I've, I've spoke about this before, actually. If you if you went to, went to Argos and bought a, a toaster and it didn't work, or it burned your toast regardless of what setting it was on, or you bought a TV and you couldn't get a picture, what would you do? You would take it back and get your money back. I never once bought a game and thought that is a pile of shit and I took it back and goes why do you want your money back because it's shit that's a legitimate reason but I don't think I certainly never took back a game because it was crap I just I took it on the chin well that's another 9.99 I'm never going to get back again yeah yeah I um I'm trying to remember I don't think I ever took any games back because um yeah because I just thought it was absolute shite um Although I did get one lucky escape with a game that I bought uh, and it wouldn't load at all. Um, that was 720 degrees uh, and they didn't have any copies of it left. So I, then I was able to change it for another game. But that was, that was it. That was the only time I was able to you know, pick up one game and exchange it for a different one. But yeah, I think the reason Squidge is on the list is because the game is unplayable say no more right okay next one i'll let you start off chris cauldron on the Cauldron 64 by palace software yeah this is, a, this is yet another one uh it, we seem to be starting a bit of a trend here with this list you look at the game it looks fantastic i, I remember at the time i thought this is one of the best looking it games i've ever seen beautiful looking game absolutely gorgeous um, looking game and uh I remember I was watching someone playing it. Um, so it was in some local shop. So this must have been about 80... Was it 85 this came out? Or was it a bit earlier than that? Yeah, I would think. I'll do my... I'll check Wikipedia where you're yeah. talking. And I thought, oh, the, the game looks great. And he must have been playing it for quite a long time because he, he was making it look easy. So, okay, right, this, this looks pretty good. 1985, yeah. 85, okay. Um, so I picked it up and, oh dear, I mean, it's, well, it, it, it's making me sound a bit like a broken record. It is borderline unplayable. 
the, the difficulty level is set right up. There's, there's no sort of gradual introduction. Mind you, there never was back then, I suppose. Um, but to actually control uh, the hag when, when she's on the broomstick uh, and that, I, no, it's, it's not fun to play. And like we said earlier, that's the number one priority, and especially back then. It was the number one priority, and uh, yeah, it wasn't with this though. It feels I, I feel I feel a bit rotten putting this one on the list because it is such a beautiful. I'm sitting looking at picture screenshots of it. It's a beautiful looking game. It's one of probably the, the prettiest looking games on the C64. Yeah. Um, well, probably on the Spectrum as well. I don't know if the, the other ones were just as unplayable. Um, and even the sound effects, I mean, it's got an awesome sort of intro. Gets, yeah, uh, yeah. audio-wise, it was spot it was, on it as was well. Just, I mean, it was a 9 out of 10. Um, I mean, well, interestingly, I'm looking here, it gets 4.2 out of 5 from classic retro games, whatever that is. It gets 5 out of 5 from My Abandonware, whatever that is. And yeah, for graphics, for sound, it is absolutely top-notch, but it is just too difficult. Now, I did a video fairly recently about it. What makes it so difficult is when you when you first start, you walk along the ground, and you've got trees, and you can only you can only take to the sky in your broomstick where there's a gap in the trees. But the problem is the baddies, the bats, and the ghosts can come down from the sky, yeah. and they can kill That's you. It. So as yeah, you walk no matter along, where you you're are, constantly getting hit. You've got like a hundred percent energy. So that's bad enough. So by the time you get to a gap in the trees, you're maybe down to 40%. You take off, you're constantly... The, the body's just... It's, it's relentless. It's just constant, yeah. constant, constant. But the real game-breaking mechanic is you can kill the bodies with firing, but every time you fire, you lose... Yeah, one, your health is going down. Energy. So it's like you've got it coming at you always. And it is just brutally impossible. Um... If anybody's completed that in one credit without cheating, you're a liar. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, don't yes, believe yes. It's, I don't believe it's possible. Did complete. you ever play the second one? It's I have, and it's all I've not I, I've not to any any particular length. I take it it can you address the difficulty. It's a different type of game, eh? Yeah, it's a totally different type of game. See, the second one again, it's still extremely tough but it's much more enjoyable than uh, than the uh, first well, definitely worth taking a look at yeah i mean one thing that i think we've got to get a, get across to anybody watching this is i'm i'm weird old school and you know i much prefer the difficulty games like manic minor and that they were difficult they were difficult yeah. but they were fair you could learn that that's it you wanted the challenge absolutely because at the end of the day once you completed the game then it was you know you're getting value for money but yeah I think the reason this game is on the list is it is simply too difficult. Yeah, he it, it, it just went, it was John Twitty, wasn't he, uh, coded this one. He just went too far with uh, the difficulty level. It's, it's not like we wanted easy games. We didn't because they were even more boring than the difficult ones. Yeah. But this was too much. It, the, the great thing nowadays is you can enjoy games like this and you can use most of the games that you play on your on through emulation. Um, there's uh, what do you call it? There's there's cheat modes. So you put infinite lives in this game, and it will become marginally more playable or infinite energy, whatever. But, yeah, I was going to say maybe infinite infinite lives would <laughs> drive me insane. I, I, I just couldn't hack it. Yeah. <laughs> but that's yeah, beautiful, beautiful looking game. Awesome sounding as well. Just too damn difficult and that is why it is number 15 on our 20 worst games ever right okay uh, number 14 in our 20 of the worst video games ever is saboteur 2 on the commodore 64 i'm going to hand you over to chris because i'm not actually familiar with this game i obviously know it in the spectrum and that is about it so over to you chris saboteur 2 why is it number 14 on our list Right, well, the most infuriating thing about this one is if you are already familiar with the Spectrum version, you are already familiar with the Commodore 64 version. This was something that Jarrell did a hell of a lot, and because this is one of the more recent games I covered, it was basically the, the straw that broke the camel's back, because it's yet another 
really lazy um, Spectrum port. They've made no attempt at all to actually code a Commodore 64 version. So it's just the, the Spectrum version ported over, lock, stock and barrel. The gameplay itself is extremely dull and boring and repetitive because the playing area is vast but just about every screen you go to looks exactly the same as the screen you just left you know, it's, it's not a flip screen one no scrolling in it i'm sure they could have made it a scrolling game if they put any effort into it but they clearly didn't put any effort at all it's entirely monochromatic and there is no excuse for monochromatic games on a Commodore 64 if you're using hardware sprites. I mean, if, you, if you're doing something like uh, uh, 3D isometric or if you're using uh, vector graphics, then yeah, there's an excuse for it. No excuse for a game like this. It's, it's basically a platform game with a bit of shooting and, and that's it. So... I'm just looking at this for the first time. It looks, it almost looks like it's unfinished. Yeah. You know, it's it's, it's so sparse looking. Yeah, and I mean, to be honest, the first game is pretty much like that as well. But of course, the first one was yet again another straight uh, uh, Spectrum port, and it's just it's this. This is the sort of thing that Jarrell did time and time and time again. You, you go through all of Jarrell's uh, releases. And you'll see it's a straight spectrum port after straight spectrum port. The trouble is, the reason they did that is because if you look at uh, the very few games where they actually did a dedicated Commodore 64 version, uh, Turbo Esprit being the uh, prime example, the game is such absolute I mean, cobblers from start to finish in every department. They didn't have anyone there who could program a Commodore 64 game. They, they just couldn't program that machine at all so 6502 uh, machine code was completely beyond them so they just stuck with really really dreary spectrum ports uh, the Commodore 64 owners deserve better than Jarrell constantly gave them every single time yeah it does yeah I mean it's, it's it, looking at the graphics it does look very like the sort of the, the sort of, not the platforms you've got like girders they look like I mean it's just it's they look like any computer designed graphics um, it, it needs to make its mind up it almost looks like it's set at night time yet the desks are, are quite clearly brown and things like that so it's just it's it's an ugly it's an ugly game isn't it oh yeah uh, very ugly graphically it is hideous um, I think it is set at night so you could you could almost say that in that regard it making you think it's at night it's worked that's about the only way it has uh if you get to the point where the character is jumping i mean it's some of the worst animation i've seen most of the animation in that game is just two frames anyway um but with the jump uh, you're actually closer to the ground when you're jumping than you are when you're uh, running along try and work that one out you managed to somehow do about five somersaults in a single jump from a from a standing position it's just so badly done so it's graphically it goes from being hideously ugly to absolutely laughable that's about the only entertainment you can actually get from the game is laughing at it when it does stuff like that <laughs> I think I think with well, a right in thinking that the main reason that you you loathe this game so much is, you know, it's you expected better on the C sixty four. It could have been so much better. I expected better, and if it had been made by just about any other uh, developer or publisher, I, I think we would have got better. Uh, there's there's really no excuse for uh, the fact that Durell just kept doing this time after time after time. Was there a good game released by Durrell Software on the C64? Uh, if there is, I haven't seen it. Uh, the closest they got was maybe Sigma 7, and that wasn't that close, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So to summarise, Chris, why is Saboteur 2 by Durrell Software on the C64 our 14th worst game ever? Right, summary, because it's uh, a lazy effort. Uh, in fact, there was no effort put into it at all. Uh, it looks awful. The gameplay is extremely boring. Um, Sound-wise, was it any good? 
sound wise it's nearly almost total silence there's no music uh there's the sound effects what there are very very sparse very very simple just no effort put into it at all from sounds good to me what we're going to do guys is the videos i mean chris and myself have looked at some of these games in sort of detail obviously i'm looking at saboteur just now well i will put links down below to where chris and i have made videos so that if you really want to subject yourself to more of this tosh you can <laughs> click on the link down below so that is number 14 on our top 20 worst game is that a top 20 how can you have a top 20 of the worst games that sounds about the worst 20 i don't know you know what i mean yeah yeah bottom so, 20 yeah, yeah we're in uh, the top 10 but in number 13th position in this list we have gone for prohibition on the atari st and i think it was lothariel software now this was one of the first ever games I ever got to play and indeed see on the 16-bit machines. It was my mate, Ian, bought an Atari ST. He'd bought that game and he also bought Arkanoid. Now, Arkanoid and the ST is a cracking game. Why is this game on the list? Very, very similar to a lot of the other games. It is quite simply borderline unplayable. It uses, it uses the mouse for you basically control you control as you can see down below it's you know it's a sort of well I'll say static screens you've got a cross here which you control using the mouse but the speed when you move the mouse the pointer to the edge of the screen it accelerates to a point that you end up overshooting where you want to stop you hear gunfire and you'll get arrows that point towards where the gunfire is coming from so as soon as you hear if it's pointing up to the left you've got to move the mouse up to the left and it'll go zoop and it'll zoop up but nine times out of ten you over you overrun and because of the layout the, because of the actual graphics itself you need to have an extremely extremely uh, good eyesight and it's the easiest game in the world just to miss it and it's quite simply unplayable because of that it's the, the the control method. I don't know how they could have made it better, possibly giving you slightly more time. It's like Operation Wolf. You've got so long to react. And the thing is, if you don't shoot them quick enough, you get shot yourself and it's game over. So really that is, I don't know if you're watching it yourself, Chris, if you can see it. It's just Yeah, I'm doing it right yeah, now. It's, it looks nice and I so much wanted to enjoy the game. I thought, oh, it's like a light gun game. It's Operation Wolf. This is going to be awesome. But it's just, it's a broken game mechanic. If they'd perhaps refined the mouse controls, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with the mouse controls. Mouse control, it gives you a good analog control. You can move, it's quite, quite precise. But the fact that the screen accelerates and sometimes it's it's so easy to actually miss that you, ever, you end up overshooting it and then you have to go back and by, by the time you find the, the, the gangster you've got to shoot, it's game over. So really, that is the reason it's number 13 on our list. Again, it's, I wouldn't say broken controls. The difficulty is just absolutely insane. And it, it makes the game pretty much unplayable. So that is... Yeah, uh, yeah. just uh, looking at it here. I mean, I'm not the biggest fan of uh, Operation Wolf type games anyway. Um, but this one... I mean, it's uh, an infograms uh, release, and they were, arms, that's it. Yeah. Uh, and they often released quite unusual, uh, uh, you know, quite unusual games all the time. It, <laughs> it's a very sort of like uh, visually, it's a very French-looking game. Um, a lot of red I mean, and this... blacks, if I remember, is it? Sorry. A, a lot of red and blacks, is it? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm it's... doing that for memory, by the way. I'm not even going on my screen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's. I mean, all of the uh, enemies, when they appear, they are all, all monochromatic, but because of the detail in them, they kind of get away with it. So, yeah, visually, it looks all right. But, yeah, uh, yeah I'm seeing, I'm actually watching the video you made of it. And, yeah, I can see when you've got the, the cursor to the end of the screen, and there's no control at all. And you basically spend, you spend entire game panicking shit it's coming from up there and you're just yeah. moving and the screens just go 
It's like, yeah. It's almost like there's an inertia built in. I don't think there is, but it's just too damn difficult. And that is why, again, it occupies number 13 in our list of the 20 worst games ever. Number 12. I can't even pronounce that again. Ga- Gammy Med. Gammy Med, is it, Chris? Yeah, Ganymede, yes. Ga- Ganymede. Uh, Firstly, what a name, really? Ga- I mean, Gammy that is something you take when you've got indigestion, isn't it? Or is that well, Gammy It doesn't work for me, whatever it is. <laughs> this game is more like to give you indigestion than anything else. Gammy Med, Gammy Med, um, really? So, uh, yeah, this was uh, an early Amiga release. Um, it's basically the, the gaming equivalent of asset stripping, because there is nothing original in this at all, whether we're talking um, the visuals, whether we're talking the gameplay, uh, whether we're talking the audio for the most part. It's all been blatantly lifted out of, uh, well... As soon as you see the title page, you can you can see uh, where we're going with this. Can I say that the title screen is actually quite quite nice? It's got a large attack. Quite nice. Uh, oh, 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 oh no, that's not an attack. That's that's a giant robot. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. Ah, right. Yeah. Okay, I beg your pardon. Yeah. Here you go. Yes. Yeah. Giant yeah. robots. <laughs> attacks. <laughs> Nothing like that in in this. So. The idea is, it, well, it's basically Attack of the Mutant Camels. So you have these uh, giant robots, and they're approaching your base, and as you see the game running, the base looks awfully familiar as well. Um, and so you're having to destroy three of these per level, um, which sounds quite easy, but uh, you have to shoot them in the head. And as soon as you get in line with the head, they will fire at you. The trouble is their shots are, are very, very multicolored, but so is the background. <laughs> so actually seeing their shots is, well, it, it requires eyesight that is far superior to anything I have. Of a hawk, yeah. <laughs> uh, so you, you can't see the shots coming at you. Um, all of the uh, audio is, it, uh, is again, lifted straight out of, well in this case is lifted all out of uh, Battlestar Galactica so all of the sound effects there. The only thing that's original is the music but they've coded the music so badly that uh, when you lose a life suddenly the music for no reason at all starts playing about a hundred times as quickly as it was. It just it, it sounds absolutely laughable, and it stays like this until you manage to get off uh, uh, the level. Then it will go back to actually playing at the normal speed until you lose your next life, and then it's back to playing at 100 miles an hour again. So it's almost, it's, it's like, uh, you know, you, you hear some ballad by some rubbish like, I don't know, uh, Celine Dion or something, and then suddenly a death metal band comes along and starts doing their version of it, and it, and it's, it just sounds laughable. It is, it's the only entertainment you'll actually get from the game, is laughing at the music when it just speeds up for, for no reason. <laughs> you know the funny thing is, Attack of Mutant Camels, which is probably my... It's probably my favourite... Well, no, I'll take that, I'll take that back. It's my favourite 8-bit Lamasoft, favourite 8-bit Lamasoft game. Uh, it's a fantastic game. You know, technically wise, Jeff Minter always described it as looking like a, a pantomime horse. The camels look mm. u- ugly as hell. I'm just laughing at your video here. The game has crashed. <laughs> um, <laughs> and he, That's the he, best thing about it. He copied. He actually copied the game from Empire Strikes Back, which was a release on the Atari. Yes, yeah, so I remember that. That's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I mean, Jeff was he was the first to plagiarize systems, but. This crowd have obviously tried to do the, exactly the same thing, but I know exactly what you mean. The bullets, they've got a, kind of, a nice kind of graduation of colour in the background. Yeah, well, they, they look like they're all uh, copper bars. You know, I don't know if you were a fan of the Amiga public domain uh, uh, scene back in the day there. Yep. The copper bars were used in every yep. bloody you know, demo, mega demo yep. everywhere. So they must have been... Uh, in, in 87, when this came out, they must have been new, so again, it was a bit of a novelty, so they had copper bars everywhere in this game. Uh, they rather overdid it. So again, it's it's one of these games, I mean, look, look, looking at the graphics, 
night. I mean, the giant robot looks really, really nice. It's pretty well animated. The backgrounds look nice. Nice kind of snow-coloured stuff going on here. Again, it's just, it's all about the detail. And it's because of the, you know, it's the little details that can basically make or break a game. Yeah, and I think they've overdone it with the, the details there. I mean, yeah, you can laugh at, you know, the fact that, oh, you have these giant robots and they're on this snow-covered, uh, uh, you know, planet. Oh, I wonder where they got that from. And then planet, you look at your... <laughs> yeah, that's it, yeah. Oh, you, you must know the one, yeah. Um, and you look at the base that you're protecting, even that looks exactly the same as the, the power generators that is the main target in the film, you know, so it's all lifted from that. And then they decided, right, well, we'll, we'll jazz it up a bit with, uh, you know, some more colourful details in the background and went completely over the top with it. And just ruin it, ruining the game in the process, yeah. 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 I mean, it's a simple game, so... They, You'd think, well, they can't really do too much to actually ruin it, but they managed it somehow, you know. I think sometimes, um, probably back then, there wasn't really so much bug testing or play testing. And I think a lot, sometimes the, the programmers, I'd imagine, because they had programmed the game, they'd probably beat a test of it so much that they probably they could probably float past it and they, they, they weren't even aware of how difficult they'd made a game. Yeah, I, I, when it came to anything like beta testing, I mean, that's the one good thing I can say about uh, modern gaming. When it comes to actually beta testing their own games, they don't do it themselves. They get someone else in to do it, and that's definitely the right way to go about it. But <laughs> clearly, that didn't happen here. I can only think of one Amiga game where it clearly did happen, uh, and it's not this one. <laughs> I like uh, when you finish the level, It can you, your, your spaceship obviously is facing to the left and the, the, the scenery comes really fast towards you and that's what happens in Attack of Mutant Camels as well mm. there's absolutely nothing wrong with copying games if they're going to be good but in the case of this one it looks nice but it's just it's, the gameplay is a bit broken through the cho some simple things like if they'd taken away the, the rainbow coloured background possibly might have been a better game mm. it, well it would have helped so anyway that's, <laughs> that's yeah. for sure yeah so anyway, that is number twelve in our top twenty of the world's not world's worst worst video games ever. We're getting near the, the, the top ten, right? And the number eleven. This is a game. It's called Grid Start. I can't remember by Anko actually. Anko, yeah. Anko were were they not the sixteen bit offshoot of uh, Analog Software? It was, yeah, I could never remember if it was Anarog or Alligator, but yeah, no, I think I, it is Anarog. I think it's, I think it's, and they also went on to make uh, Kick Off, Kick Off as well, I think yeah. it was. Yeah, uh, Kick Off, Kick Off 2, tip off, which tip off. I thought was alright. Yeah, Tip Off was a basketball version, but Grid Start, I remember, I can, it's funny how when I see certain games, I can remember where I was when I bought it. I was actually in a, I was in Edinburgh, and it was, it was a place that sold, uh, they sold, shareware and I went up to buy it it was like 10 discs for like 10 quid or something mm -hmm. and they had a, a small selection of games and I picked this up and I thought wow that looks just like pole position but even better so I shelled out I shelled out the money loaded it up and it just like the, the actual the bit that really sold me the game was the graphics it just looked awesome the card graphics looked incredible you start the game it plays fine but then when you start to turn, it all goes Pete Tong. And it's quite simply because the car, the physical car size is too big for the road. If you turn round, you're almost hitting the side of the road. And there's bales of hay at the side of the road. And you so much as brush against a bale of hay and the car explodes in a ball of fire. <laughs> now that's all, that's fine as a video game, it's all fantasy. But... Just trying to navigate around a corner is nigh on impossible, and it's not helped the fact that you can be driving along, and a car will come up, come up from behind you. Obviously, there's no—I don't think there was mirrors in the game. I can't remember, but you'll see down below if there was. I don't think there was a car. No, I don't think there was. No, a car would come up from behind you, try and overtake you, clip you, kaboom, and again it was lights out. 
This could almost be one of those games where it's so bad it's good because you, you're just sitting there laughing at it. But with one important caveat, which is it's so bad it's good providing you are watching someone else play it. <laughs> if you're playing it, it is just an object in sheer frustration. Uh, it's, I mean, I, I, I agree with you completely, especially at the time. So I think this was another early, was it 87 I think uh, it was released. a really time blank up, actually, yeah. Let's, let's see if I can find it on my channel. And like, like everyone in 87, you know, we, we were seeing these new like, Atari ST and Amiga games, and we would look at uh, the, the graphics in it, and we'd think, uh, yeah, we'd think, yeah, that, look, <laughs> that looks great. Um and then you actually play it, and uh, yeah, it's another one of it, it's it's like the play testing was a complete afterthought. The entire gameplay was a complete afterthought. They wanted it to look good, which it does for its day. Uh, yeah, and if I remember, it's got quite a it's got quite a nifty uh, sort of heavy rock intro. I mean, a lot of the early games on the the sixteen bit. It had, uh, it had, oh, there's a good start there, it had uh, like I, a lot of sampled music, mm. so it sounded really, really impressive. Star Glider is always the title that stands out for me <laughs> with that one. Yeah. But the difference is Star Glider is actually a good game. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, I, I'm looking, yeah, I'm looking at this game here, I mean, uh, again, yeah, it's just, it's, it looks, it looks lovely, I mean, it, the road... The road update's lovely, and it's ticking all the boxes. <laughs> I'm approaching a corner, a slop, boom, yeah. brush. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and that's the gameplay in a nutshell, yeah. That's it. I mean, I've just exploded three times in the last six seconds. It is just, it is virtually unplayable. And as I say, when you see the car cornering, it's it virtually takes up the whole, the whole of the road. So there's just, there's just really not enough space for cars to get past you and again if they had if they'd possibly kick, maybe kicked back a wee bit stopped making you explode when you hit a, a signpost or a barely hey god forbid and more importantly made the car that wee bit smaller it would have been probably a lot better it would have been pole position for the Amiga and that's what everyone right. wanted when they bought this and that's what we're wanting absolutely so yeah again I know a lot of the games that were featured in this they're they were borderline, they could have been fantastic games, and it's just this wee tweaks of game mechanics that made them appear in this list. So that is why, grid start, awesome looking game, but it was broken because the car was simply too big, you exploded when you touched a bailey hay, and cars could simply not get past you without you exploding, and that is why it occupies position 10, sorry, position number 11 on our list. Now we're in, the, we're in the home street, we're in the top 10. Yeah, we're in the top 10 we're now. In the top 10. And we've got an absolute doozy at number 10, sticking with uh, driving games, and I'm just going to look for it as we speak. We have got the mighty hard driving, no G at the end, hard driving on the C64. Now I'll let you, any particular reason, Chris, that this is occupying number 10? Is, is there a reason why it shouldn't? Um, sorry, can um, I just interject very quickly, Chris, before, yeah. sorry to interrupt. I've just noticed I've got a feature called possibly the worst game ever, Grid starting the Commodore 64. I actually made the same video twice because it's so bad. I didn't realise I'd done it twice. That's how bad that game is. Oh, yeah, so it's doubly deserving its place in the list. Sorry, Chris, hard driving on the C64. Why is uh, it so push? I mean... The, the the very idea, if you can remember hard driving from uh, you know, the the coin op original, the very idea of trying to convert that to eight bit computers was laughable. It was every bit as ridiculous uh, an idea as all the Sega Wireboard games uh, that were being converted at the time. So we knew it was not going to be good. We just had no idea how not very good it was going to be. It is visually, I think, one of the worst games I have ever seen on any system at any point in time. It's... I mean, they decided to make it monochromatic, and when you consider it's using 3D polygons on the Commodore 64, so it's having to overcome its fairly slow processor, so you could understand that. But then they decided, right, we'll make it 
blue and yellow. So it has this really horrendous <laughs> colour scheme. Yeah. Um, it is unbelievably slow. I mean, at some points you're supposed to be doing 140 miles an hour or something, or is it kilometres? I, <laughs> I, I think it's miles an hour. Yeah. And it looks like you're barely doing 10. Um, the other cars, as they're coming towards you, uh, there's one, I think it's meant to be a van, but it looks more like a garden shed. <laughs> it's, uh, and then it, you get to the controls. Um, because obviously with the arcade original, you had, we had the full controls. You had the, the clutch by changing gear. Uh, you had the steering wheel. Obviously, you're not going to have any of that in the uh, Commodore 64 version. I've got to admit, I don't know how well they've implemented the clutch to change gear bit because I never played it with anything other than automatic transmission. I didn't even entertain the idea. Um, and then to make up for the lack of uh, analog left and right, um, if you look as I'm hoping there's going to be a, a, a screenshot or of the game uh, running. No, that's, yeah, that's Okay, if you look just below the, the steering wheel and, and you've got your info panel there, you can see there's this like, white bar and um, there's a line in there indicating how centralised the uh, le you know, your steering is, which is probably the best that they could they could do as far as the visual, but the actual implementation of it, as soon as you start turning, you constantly are turning in that direction. You can let go of the joystick. You're still going to be turning in that direction. So you spend the whole of uh, your actual go of this zigzagging across the road as you're desperately trying to centralize the steering wheel. When you finally do get it centralized, you realize you're going off at an angle while the road's going straight ahead anyway. It's one of the most unplayable games I've ever played. So you're constantly, I'm just watching my video, you're constantly compensating. You're constantly, oh, left, oh, right, yeah. oh, left. And you're just, yeah. you're trying to get a skid, you're constantly, I'm just, my video here, I'm all over the place. I can't actually go in a straight line. The, the one semi-redeeming feature about this was that the Commodore 64 version was never actually released as a standalone uh, title. Is that right, really? Yeah, it was... I mean, the Spectrum Amstrad versions, the 16-bit the versions, they all got a release. For some strange reason, I can't fathom it at all having seen, you know, having played it myself, the Commodore 64 version didn't get released. And the only way you could get it, it's... Uh, they brought it out in a one of their compilations. So the Commodore 64 uh, compilation, you basically had this exclusive game you can get anywhere else. So did this, but you didn't want did to. this get a full release on other systems then? Mm. Yeah, the Spectrum, Amstrad, both 16-bit uh, computers, uh, they all got the, the, the full release. The 64 was the only one that didn't. Um, I think, well, look, you just got to look at it. I think you can see even uh, Domark, wasn't it, who did yeah. this one. Even they took one look at this and thought, we can't release this. You know? and, and they just, well, they must have had it sitting there and thinking, well, we've got to do something with it, right? We'll stick it in this compilation. There you go. We'll get it out the door that way. Yeah, we'll, we'll give it a slight, we'll give it half a point redeem, redemption because they decided not to actually release this as a standalone. Um, the thing is, if you look at the little uh, sort of uh, the little control panel down the bottom, it all looks very, very nice. But uh, yeah, it's. I, I think it's a perfect example of it was simply too much. But then you look at something like uh, Stunt Car Racer on the C sixty four, and it's a blinding port. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Stunt Car Racer showed that it was absolutely doable, but you needed someone with programming talent like. Uh, Jeff Crammond yeah. and you know Domark didn't have anyone even remotely <laughs> close to his level. Maybe somebody at Donald Solford was at a loose end so they thought mm -hmm. he's having a crack at this. <laughs> that, would, that would explain an awful lot yeah. So the reason the reason Chris in a summary why is hard driving on our list? Uh, it looks utterly hideous. Oh I forgot to also mention the uh, sound effects especially the tyre squeal have you envious of deaf people 
it's it, it audio wise it is hor utterly horrendous and it is simply one of the most unplayable games ever to have been released so you're going to bleed through your eyes and through your ears if you play this mm. pile of crap yeah so that yeah that's that's number 10 now sticking with uh, well up to number nine again sticking with the c64 and again this is a game i have never actually played chris I'm presuming based on the, the popular TV series, it is the A-Team on the Commodore 64, <laughs> so I'll let you take this one away, I'm going, have you done a video on this one, yeah? Yeah, I did the video oh, of this all oh, years ago. Uh, this is quite an infamous release. Is uh, it A-Team, by the way, or is it A just... Uh, a uh, it you know? should... I can't actually remember. It doesn't matter, I'll just have a wee look. Okay. Yeah. Um... So this came out in 1985, so bear that in mind, this came out a year after Impossible Mission, after uh, Pit Stop 2, after Summer Games, so they had really raised the bar uh, as far as how Commodore 64 games who was this? sound Sorry, and play. Who, who released this? Uh, well this was released by Courbois Software, it was programmed by someone called Eric Pettermeyer, right. it was a Dutch fella. And, um, one look at it and it will tell you straight away <laughs> this was not an officially licensed game no with the spelling of the names murdoch ck yeah now the, the good thing about that title page is that it does actually give you the names of the people underneath them because otherwise you wouldn't have the faintest idea who they were supposed to be the other thing is the title page for some reason plays the star wars theme even though <laughs> I mean, it's not as if the Star Wars theme and the 18 theme sounded that much alike, so quite why he did that, I will never know. He didn't even code uh, the music himself. He lifted it out of another game called Cyclones, um, which I had back in the day, um, but he sped it up an awful lot. So, so he didn't actually code the, uh, the music. He took it from another game, even though it had absolutely nothing to do with this thing, you know, the Star Wars theme as the theme tune to the A-Team game. What makes it even worse is that is the only audio anywhere in the game at all. The actual game itself is played in total silence. <laughs> then you get to the game itself, and I get the impression you've just I'm seen... I'm watching your video, you're yeah. shooting faces at the top of the screen. So, yeah, so you get these four floating faces of the A-team at the top of the screen and you are this soldier at the bottom there shooting up at them and that is it. That is the entire gameplay game from start to finish. That's the that's the whole game. So even though it's called the A-team, you don't actually play as any member of the A-team. You're this, this soldier at the bottom who's just shooting at them for reasons that are never given. Um, I mean, they're shooting down at you, which of course... They never did, you know, they never shot people in the A-Team. They always used, I don't know, like paintball guns or something, or bloody, oh, well, whatever it was they'd cobble together from the shed that they were imprisoned in, you know, as it always was. So, it, other than using the actual title, the A-Team, and having these very, very vague representations of the uh, four characters, that is all it has to do with the actual program. I cannot believe, well, obviously there will be plenty of people who bought it purely on the strength of, oh, it's the A-Team, you know, oh, I'm a big fan of the television program, I'll go and buy it. I cannot believe anybody bought this and actually liked it. You could have called it, you could have called this the Game of Thrones official license game and just having these big sprite faces moving. It's actually, yeah. it's got, it's actually got more in common with Space Invaders. Mm. That'll be a completely shit version of Space Invaders. In fact, I'm just laughing at level two appears to be. I mean, you've got the. You can see there you've got the four faces moving back and forwards, shooting bullets, giant <laughs> faces. Then it, level two appears to be. I don't know what one it is because they all look the same to me. Yeah. He's moving yeah. and he's going invisible. So it's almost like the Atari 2600 version of Space Invaders where they go invisible for a short time. Well, each of the four. I mean, this this is the, the height of. Uh, variation in the game. Each of the four faces, they all move differently. So you have Murdoch, I think he just moves slowly side to side. Um, I think Face does exactly the same, but a bit faster. Uh, then you get uh, 
BA, I think he's the one, he stays stationary somewhere and then so suddenly instantly appears somewhere else. And then Hannibal, he's moving slowly side to side, but then he also disappears for a little while and then reappears somewhere else. This is, this is, uh, I actually wish we'd moved this one further up the list because this is absolutely... I, th I think we've been very generous towards uh, this one. Awful. I mean, if, if they were actually, if they actually looked like, if they, it, the basis of the game is, what's the game? Is it Nam something or another on the, the Neo Geo? Where you play the part of a crack commando, moving left to right and shooting at guys. That's what this game is based on. But instead of actually going to any effort to try and give these soldiers that move and dare I say are animated, they've just stuck big, huge, big expanded sprites, which are see-through. So when you're playing it, when you're playing it against a black background, the guy with the hat looks like a cat because he's got his face is black, not like inverted. <laughs> It is. It is. Oh man! Uh, do you use the uh, Lemon Sixty Four website? Pardon? Do you use the Lemon Sixty Four no, website? No, no. On, well, on yeah, there, yeah, yeah. I do know. Yeah, I know off the site. Sorry, Lemon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. On there, this was I think rated the third worst Commodore Sixty Four game of all time, but it was number one among the Commodore Sixty Four games that actually got a public release. And I think it entirely deserves uh, deserves that. Was this a full a full Buna release? I, at seven pound ninety nine. See, I'm I, I'm pretty sure it was a full price one, but I don't think it actually got a distribution. I think uh, if you were to buy it, there was like a small ad or something in in the back of the computer magazines, and you would order it off this guy because it's like no, no distributor would have put this in the shop, surely. <laughs> So oh, we can only hope that nobody actually made any money from this. I I dearly hope so. No one deserves to, for sure. I'm not even going to ask you to summarise Chris why this is on the list. I think we'll. Uh, I think the video down below is going to say it all. It, it will show you everything you need to know. Brilliant. Right, number eight. Um, again, mm, controversial, but uh, again, it feels slightly unfair to have this on the list. It's another palace game. We've already looked at Colvin and it is the Evil Dead by Palace Software oh. again on the C64. I did personally buy this game. I believe I don't think it's I don't know if it's a rare game, but I think that eventually did it not come something's niggling me. Uh, it was either it, it was definitely released as a standalone game. Something's yeah. niggling me that it was bundled with Cauldron on the back. Or did you get the, both the Spectrum and the Commodore 64 version on the one tape? Oh, I think something, you're right the second time there. I think you had the 64 like and Spectrum versions together. Yeah. Something like that. Why would this game be in the list? I remember, I don't know when Evil Dead came out, that the game, was it probably 1984, 1985, it came out maybe about a year or so after the Evil Dead film, which is a, an absolute classic horror oh, yeah, film. Yeah. It's a fantastic film, loved it to bits. And I remember, um, probably slightly naively, seeing this, and it wasn't Zap; it was it was it predated Zap. I remember seeing this getting released. I saw the big advert with the horror, horrible zombie thing. I thought this is going to be terrifying, and it was the fact that it was published by Palace Software, who Palace were obviously a, a publishing company. I think they 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 put out the Evil Dead in video. Am I right in thinking that? Oh, I think they did. Yeah, they yeah, did, yeah. It was one of the sort of classic. VHS companies back in the day, mm. so I bought this. It looked looked at the graphics, you know. Um, it just you know it had the, you've got a little swinging chair outside, and it just it's it looks. You read it, you read through it. You've got to try and uh, what, what's the, the the premise of the game? You've got to try. And you're playing the part of what's his name again? Ash. Ash. So uh, yeah, you're Ash. Yeah, you've got to try um, and get the book of the dead or something, haven't you? Well. There's the provider of the game, which is written in the instructions in the cassette inlay, and then there's actually what you need to do when you're playing it. Um, I think a lot of what they wrote in the instructions was just absolute bloody you know, written equivalent of verbal diarrhea. All you actually had were doing when you were playing the game was trying to survive. Uh, it kept saying, I, I think it said something like, if you made it through the night and you could get the, the Book of the Dead, I think if you destroyed it by throwing it on the fire, um, you would then get the final boss thing turning up and then you had to 
somehow try and defeat him and, and that will be the game completed. Well, I never saw anything like that at, at all. So I, I think it was basically, you know, shoots the, well, the, the, the people who had been uh, possessed, you know, your, your friends that had been possessed, uh, when you, well, actually, no, you didn't shoot them, did you? If you hit them with the axe or whatever, uh, you know, whatever weapons you could pick up, um, and then you had the dismembered body parts all coming <laughs> after you, which just looked absolutely comical. It didn't look remotely so scary at all. Uh, and it just kept looping round over and over again. I mean, it looks like, I'm looking at, I'm watching the video just now, and it, it, it's, if, it, if they'd made it more like Attic Attack on the Spectrum, it would have probably been mildly um, entertaining and mildly playable, but what, I'm just going to fast forward my video a wee bit, what makes it particularly difficult is you can't move diagonally. You can only face up, down, that, left, Yeah, right. that's right, yeah. And up, so, down, left, or right, yeah, that's it. Yeah, you can't move it, and the whole, you spent the entire game trying to close doors. Yeah. And then a baddie would open the door and come through, and you're just constantly, constantly, uh, constantly trying to close doors, and your energy goes down so, so quickly, and as you say, the body parts attack you, and it's it's game over. It's just, it's again, it's insanely difficult. Um, they could have made it, they could have made it a playable game. I mean, it's a, it was a big, big game at the time, and it's 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 one of these games. I don't know whether the Spectrum version is just as bad. Have you played any other versions at all? No, oh, I've only played 64. That was quite enough. Yeah. And trying to, again, I'm watching the video here. You had to, you had to kind of line yourself up, bang on, to be able to lock a door, close a door. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, uh, and the, the the other thing is uh, that also applied whenever you were attacking any any of the enemies because otherwise y your health uh, went down so bloody quickly that even if you were attacking them and actually got a hit and killed the thing, y y your health is down to almost zero as soon as you've taken out just one of them. <laughs> but you just you, you you spend the entire game closing doors. And then somebody would come in and open the door, you know. Um, on paper, it looked like a great game, but it was just infernally difficult. And again, the, the mechanics of the game just rendered it almost unplayable, I would think. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I mean, you could almost say that it being unplayable is uh, a, a, a plus point because it meant that uh, you were never tempted to ever load this thing up <laughs> after uh, you know the, the first time. That was quite enough. And I, I know people might be watching this video thinking, yeah, yeah, you're just you've got access to all these games and you're just picking games that you you think look bad. I remember buying this at the time and I really wanted to like it so badly. And back then, you didn't really you didn't really think or believe that you could have a bad game you thought maybe it's just me maybe I'm just playing it wrong maybe I'm missing out on something yeah. but revisiting the game 35 years on like, it is just wholly as unplayable as it ever was um, to the point it was no fun at all even even picking up weapons I mean I, I don't even recall ever getting to kill anything um, well, also remember, does, uh, once you picked up the weapon, you could only keep it for a set amount of time, and then you suddenly lost it for no reason at all, and you had to then go around and try and find another one. And before you know, you've got a, a set of dis, disembodied legs and what have you chasing you. So, yeah, it was. It could have been again. It could have been all so much better, but uh, again, the, the game mechanics just ruined what could have been a potentially wonderful game, and that is why it is occupies number eight in our world. So our top 20 worst games on the C64. Now we're getting into the real, the real doozies. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. We're on to number seven, and uh, it's based on a, a TV program which I reckon could probably go in one of the probably the top three worst pro TV programs ever, and it's EastEnders. Now let me try and find this. I'm sh I'm sure. Well, I, don't, I don't want to give any. Sp why am I? Why am I trying to use the mouse to control my iPad? Sorry. Uh. <laughs> yeah, sorry. EastEnders. It's these games that are doing it. To you. <laughs> no, well, just think about it, guys. Chris and I have endured these games, so you don't have to. <laughs> Let me try and right. EastEnders, Chris. What? What are your? Have you actually seen this game? Have you played? Well, it? I've I've seen it, but I have been spared the um, the pleasure, if that is even close to being the right word, of ever actually playing it. Um, 
But what I've seen of it, it just, I don't have the remotest clue what anyone is doing while they're playing it. But the weird thing is, I'm not the only one. You know, I, I, people who are playing this thing in the videos I've seen, they have no idea what they're doing either, even though they've got the instructions written out in front of them. What to do, Chris, is load up my video so we're both watching the same video of it. Right. And if you just type in EastEnders, Main Meister. Now, oh, bollocks, my, my iPad's about to die. The thing, the thing that gets me is, I understand that licenses sell games. You know, you get a, a big... Terminator 2, oh, you're going to want to go and play the video game. EastEnders, I mean, what is the most exciting thing in EastEnders? I always remember watching a Billy Connolly video, and he was talking about EastEnders. He says, he says, why do people watch it? Um, and it's a, uh, right, okay, I'm going out to drive the van. Okay, cheerio, bye. Fucking never and stuff, really, you know what I mean? Hey. Was, you know, it was just, it was awful. EastEnders is a terrible programme. Why would well, that be the basis? When when they were sitting round, I presume they must have sat around the designer table. Right, guys, EastEnders. Right, what can we put in? Did somebody get killed? Nope. Um, I don't know. Let me think. Making dinner. Yeah, we could make that a sub level. So yeah, let's just let's just. You can see the video down below. Let me just fast forward to it. I mean, the choice, the actual choice of uh, gameplay was just excruciating. Yeah, it was by a company called Maxon Software. Now, below is the ZX Spectrum one. Now, let's... Yeah, that's the video I have uh, running right now. Yeah, let's have a look. If you fast forward to... Yeah, it, it starts off... If you fast forward to, let me see, oh, about... Yeah, 250 into the video, you've got the controls. It starts off with a, a screen... If you go to 257 on my video, you'll see there, I don't know what that's supposed to be. It looks like a guy in a TV shop. 257, <laughs> you've got a train track on the left hand, right hand side. You've got what looks like coloured boxes. The relevance of which I have absolutely no idea. Yeah. Now, from what I believe, this is the one and only time I ever played this. And I still wake up with a cold sweat when I think about it. <laughs> you start off in this god awful screen. And if you walk to the side, let's have a look, I'm trying to walk, there we go. Even trying to act, actually, you can see the graphics for the guy moving are just, I don't even know who you're supposed to play. There, there we go, walk to the left. It looks like you're in what I can assume was the Arthur Fowler's allotment. You've got. What oh, like you know the program a lot better than I do. <laughs> I did watch it briefly back in the 80s. Yeah, there's a screen here where the idea of the game is to clip the head off flowers. Now, the movement is absolutely diabolical. Um, even trying to achieve what you're supposedly set out to do. I mean, I'm assuming the cross here is like a pair of scissors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. if you press fire button, it's, you, cl you, you clip the head off flowers. Well, maybe not. I'm not even. I'm doing that just now, and I'm not even got any kind of score. So that is that is the first level. Um, I don't know how far else I got into the into the game. I seem to remember the phone is constantly ringing throughout the game as well, and you you, you can't actually tell what the hell it's for. <laughs> I can't remember. Honestly, can't remember. Right here we go. Right, if you fast forward to five forty two in the video, your it appears your. Uh, 542 in the video, it appears that you're underneath, you're a sort of midget. Yeah, you've, a you've shrunk, yeah. Yeah, you're, you're, you're standing beneath a table with what looks like, I don't know, I don't even, is that a cauliflower or a lettuce on the, on the right hand side? Then you're, uh, I, I'm going to guess yes. Yeah, so. I don't know, I'm, a, I'm presuming you're, or is it a market stall or something you're under? I think mean, it must be. Yeah, must be you can walk up and down. Um, quite what you're actually supposed to do here, is, I have got absolutely no idea. The fact that I'm watching myself playing this doesn't really help because I've got no idea what I'm doing. But yeah, I mean, you've got that, and then again, if you go to, if you fast forward to seven fifteen, you've got 
<laughs> they've obviously ran out of colour. Seven fifteen. It looks like you're uh, you've got somebody in bed. You've got somebody in yeah, bed. Yeah, I'm on that. Is that a baby, possibly? Um, well, a monochromatic <laughs> baby. I mean, you can't. T- I mean, it does literally look like something a five-year-old has drawn. <laughs> But it looks like something out the out the the Exorcist. I mean, it looks Ooh. like I don't know what it is. It looks like a sunflower in bed with a, a potato for a mouth. Hideous. Maybe maybe it was uh, the granny. I can't remember what she was called. Now I'm assuming that you've you've got a kind of bottle on the left hand side, which I, I can only presume you've got to try and feed feed the baby or feed the granny, whatever it is. Let's see if I actually achieve this. It must, it must, it must be a baby, surely. I mean, you you don't feed grannies from bloody. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe I'm not sure saying, but I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, I, I've I've absolutely lost. I'm completely lost. And to finish this one off, if you fast forward to nine fifty seven, you end up in a laundry. Nine fifty seven. Right. You're in a laundry of some sort. Presumably the one that uh, was it Doc Cotton used to manage. Well, Doc Cotton is a name that sounds familiar. Yeah, so now, yeah, there you go. Again, the perspective is all horribly wrong. You've got these washing machines at the top of the screen. You've got washing machines down below. You control. Well, it looks like I'm controlling a basket. Uh, yeah. So you turn into a washing basket. Yeah. And, <laughs> now I'm assuming. Are clothes, are dirty clothes going to fall out of the washing machine? Oh, I've, I've just managed to get 150 points there. It looks like you've got to move the basket over a washing machine or something. I have got... You know what, Chris? I think we've had enough of this. Really, yeah. what were Maxed and Software thinking of? I mean... <laughs> how this... I mean, th- this... this... Definitely is a, you know, a fine representation of people making uh, a, a computer game, a video game, whatever, Fast and clearly having no idea what it is about uh, video games that people, you know, that makes people want to play them. No one has ever sat there thinking, you know, what this video game really needs to make it great is a section where I'm cutting the heads off flowers. Or I, I'm I'm emptying uh, you know washing baskets in a laundrette, you know. And feeding feeding a baby, yeah, can't yeah. That, yeah, putting putting washing on. Can you imagine that features putting washing on, de deheading flowers and feeding a, a screaming child? What what were they thinking? The next time you're complaining about spending ninety nine pence on a video game for your iPhone, just remember these standards and think how lucky you are. And this was a full price game, remember? This, this was, was this was ten quid. This was a full price game. And that is why it is number seven. It, it could quite easily now to be honest, our top ten could quite easily have been in any order. Yeah. That one could I actually forgot just how atrocious that one was. Right, and number six position, and I know this isn't one that you're familiar with, Chris, but if you have a look on my channel, it is called Attack of the Phantom Karate Devils. Now, just to refresh my own memory, let me just find that. See what it was called. Right, I've got it up and running. Possibly the worst game ever. Attack of the Phantom, whatever it was called. There we go, Karate Devils. Yeah, there it's there. Now, this was released by... Does it actually tell me who it was released by? No, it doesn't actually. Let me just fast forward a wee bit. Apologies for the. Uh... So it was by, well, it was released by Phantom Software in '83, and it's by someone called John Orthol, who I've never so, heard of. To be, before we kind of start slagging it off, yeah, Phantom Software. There we go. Before we start slagging it off, it was a very, very early game, so we could give it that. Now it's got quite. A, if you're looking at the title screen. It's got quite an exciting looking title screen. You've got a ninja, uh, a large ninja at the bottom, um, who is obviously fighting. Here we go, you've arrived at the temple of the diabolical ninja. Then you just get, if you if you fast forward to fi- about 52 seconds in, you get this yeah. cornucopia of keys you've got to try and press. Yeah, it's all, it's all the, uh, 
Well, okay, I've, I've gone past the, uh, yes, the vast number of uh, controllers that yeah, uh, we now, have here. Graphically wise, it looks okay. It looks like, you can see there, you've got the Shailon Temple in the background. It's all ASCII uh, Yeah, it's all, uh, it's all, yeah. Then you've got what can only be described as some sort of uh, ghostly ninja. You've got his head, a floating head with floating hands that are attacking you. And it's just, it is, it is impossible. It quite literally is impossible to actually get any sort of score. Um, I managed to get 18 points. It's just, it's, yeah, it's an early game. And, I mean, the head, the, the head of the guy looks like it's totally shrunk as well. Um, it's it's probably a game you really need to actually play to witness just how unplayable it is. The sad thing well, is, I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm seeing it here, and uh, well, you can clearly see that the 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 main sprite in it is well, he's, he's actually made up of one, two, three, four, five, six different sprites who have been joined together, and of course they're all expanded, so they look hideous. Um, at no point does he ever put his arms down by his sides, which is just as well, because if he did, it looks like they'd be dragging on the floor. <laughs> uh, the <laughs> perspective is all yeah. horrendously wrong. <laughs> you can see there, I mean, that there's, there is literally no frame of animation. It just flicks between his yeah. arm up and punching. There is no, uh, there is no animation in between. Um, yeah, it's it's thoroughly unplayable. And again, yeah, we're maybe being slightly uh, unfair. It was an early, early game. Um, I think probably the most impressive thing about this game is the name. Yeah, <laughs> it's about the only impressive Devils. thing about it. <laughs> so yeah, it's maybe unfair to have this one, but it's wholly unplayable, and it's it's what an early game was, and that is why it occupies number six on our list. And we're now into the top five. In fifth place, we have Crazy Cars 1 and 2. Now, you've picked the Commodore 64 version, Chris. I'm not familiar with that. I have played it on the Commodore Amiga, and I remember it was a pile of awful on the, on the Amiga. Yeah. Um, well, so I've, I've had to split it between two games, essentially. So we got uh, yeah the first and second uh, 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 jointly uh, held this. Because um, if you take a look on my channel there and, and you look at the uh, uh, shit game database there, uh, right? So you get uh, the first, you know, just start the first one, uh, and one, yeah. So this again was a full price game, so it was ten quid, and when you see it running. You have seen plenty of Mastertronic games that look, play, and sound better than this. When, when did this come out, Chris? Was this a fairly... This was late on in the, the C60. This game, must right? have been 87, I think, yeah. this one. Because, of course, there was an Amiga version as well, and I think the Amiga version came out at the same time. So it's got to be around 87. It can't be any uh, earlier than that. So bear in mind, we had games like Super Cycle. That's right, yeah. So we'd had Super Cycle, we'd had uh, uh, Pit Stop 2, you know, we'd had some great races on the Commodore 64. Not a huge number, there weren't that many uh, really great uh, Commodore 64 racing games, but we did have some. Um, and then this came along. Uh, when you see the game running, as I get the impression you just... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so the car doesn't so much sort of move across the road it, it, it sort of like jumps and skits about all over the place it, it almost looks like you've got some sort of insect on the screen that's uh, just flickering around everywhere and then with the audio especially with a tire squeal it even sounds like you've got some insect on the screen there that's just flickering about all over the place um, the the, the roads that you're on, there are some which are just utterly ridiculous. The, the corners, the, you know, are extremely tight. 
and they go on and on and on and you realize that this rose drawn is actually more like a corkscrew because there is no way this corner could go on for this long without it constantly going back on itself uh, time after time um the road routine is absolutely awful um the uh I mean, uh, graphically it looks i mean even if it had come out in 84 it would have been basic in the extreme um and this, and this was 1987 and it was 10 quid so you think okay they're really taking the yeah they're, they're taking the piss with this one and then the following year they then released crazy cars 2 and have a look at that. And, um, so with that one, the Amiga version of Crazy Cars 2 was thankfully totally different to uh, the first one. I say thankfully, I mean the Amiga version of Crazy Cars 2 was a truly awful game. Yeah. Um, but with this, what they basically did was change uh, the main sprite, the, the, the car you're controlling, they changed... Uh, the other cars on the road, so they're now all police cars, and used everything else from the first Crazy Cars game. Uh, the sound effects are exactly the same. They're the same ones. The road routine is exactly the same. Um, so it bears no resemblance to the Amiga version at all. The annoying thing with the Amiga version is you have to keep referring to the map to find out which route to take in order to get to the finish line of the race you were doing. I take it it wasn't as advanced as you could go left or right like in pits and out on. Um, oh. Well, uh, with the Amiga version, that was pretty much what, what you were having to do. and You had to find which turning to take in order to get to the finishing line and everything else. Now, with the uh, Commodore 64 version, none of that is in it. So it is just straight, you know, race from point A to point B, and you've done that stage. It is ridiculously easy. Uh, I think the first time I uh, played it, I got to about level eight, and the only reason I didn't get any further than that was I just, you know, stopped playing. Said, right, that's it. I've had enough. Um, so it's it's like, as if the first game wasn't bad enough for them to essentially release exactly the same game again yeah. call it uh you know call it crazy cars 2 and expect people to pay another 10 quid i mean somewhere out there somebody did that they they bought the first one for whatever reason possessed them decided they were then going to buy the second one so they spent 20 quid on these two <laughs> Absolutely. Piles of awfulness. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just like, it's a complete glitching mess. I mean, I'm looking here, you're, you were on Route 40, and you're now on Route 89, and it's just exactly the same. It's exactly yeah. the same. I mean, it's, when, I think, I think the reason this, we can quite happily see this as one of the worst games ever, is you see, when you think back, when you think back even maybe three years beforehand, or maybe two years beforehand, you had stuff like, uh, was Buggy Boy? Possibly, yeah, Buggy Boy was... Oh, big, Buggy Boy had been out so at least a year Buggy before this, awesome yeah. Game. You've got Super Cycle, you've got Pit Stop 2, you've got even, yep. even Pole Position, even the original Pole Position. Yeah, even game. the original Pit Stop, exactly. which was very basic. Excellent uh, games, and then you get something like this. Again, it's almost like, I mean, uh, the, the Commodore Amiga one was atrocious. It was all fur coat, no knickers. And it's almost like they just took the same template and did exactly the same. Yeah. And I understand possibly why they, they, they could maybe get away with the, the Commodore Amiga being one being crap is because they didn't have, have to make a lot of effort. This was a brand new system. Let's put a game with lovely graphics. We don't really know how to do scrolling, but it doesn't matter. The kids won't really bother about that. But this was a system that the, the programmers had kind of got to had got to grips with exactly yeah they had years of experience with programming it they were capable yeah. of doing well you, you look at the stuff like again i always use this as the example impossible mission you look at stuff like Wizball, they knew how to code games that played great and looked great there was no excuse for anything looking like this it was just they were just trying to get money in the bank as quick as they possibly could so absolutely no excuse but you know what? I've got to say, Titus Software did redeem themselves. They went on to put out the third. It wasn't called Crazy Cars 3. It was called uh, 
American, the uh, oh, what was it called? American Challenge or something? I can't remember. It's actually at the start of my intro on my videos, and it's an exceptional game. Yeah, like now I, I'm familiar with. I don't actually know it as Crazy Cars Three. I am familiar with it, but it's one of those games that I can't review because it's using uh, interlaced graphics on the uh, 64, and that does my head in. So I can't, uh, I can't, I can't even play it, let alone review it. But yeah, I have seen some videos of that, and it it looks a billion times better than either of these two. So. That could be, it could be Titus's only decent game. But of course, typically I can't play it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think, again, we don't have to really summarise that game, or another one, or the two games. The fact is that they released a game that looked and played as awful as it did is completely shameful. Yeah. Hang your head in shame, Titus Software. Yeah, yeah, definitely for that so one. So that is number five in our list. Two seconds, Chris. My iPad has just run out. Right, okay. Number four on our list of the worst games ever. It's uh, Ninja Hamsters on the Commodore 64. And again, Chris, I'm not familiar with this one, so I'll let you explain to the viewers why should this deserve a place. Uh, right. Well, you being unfamiliar with this one, you, you, you can only begin to imagine how fortunate you are. Um... <laughs> So this is another CRL game, which uh, as soon as you hear those three letters, you, you straight away have a pretty good idea of what to expect. Um, but it says it all really uh, about CRL. I mean, they, they release a game like, uh, oh, what was it called? Um, uh, uh, Trigger Happy which, I mean, was absolute crap from start to finish. And then it turns out that that was probably the best game they ever published. Um, and this, even by CRL standards, this is probably the worst they ever did. It's another straight Spectrum port. Um, the graphics, okay, they are very, well, they're, they're completely monochromatic. Quite detailed, or at least. I have to say. They do look quite detailed. Well, they look detailed until you realize when you see them overlap, which they do constantly, and you realize they're completely transparent. So when they overlap, all you see are these complete mess of black pixels everywhere, and you can't make out what anything is. I, mean, I, I think the whole concept is ridiculous. So it, it might sort of be borderline one of these sort of cutesy type of games which I absolutely detest as, as anyone who's even looked at my channel knows I, I, I just can't be doing with it at all um, so we have this ridiculous concept of this ninja hamster um, and incidentally when you look at the, uh, uh, the graphics there of the game this thing that you are actually controlling does not look even vaguely like a hamster at all. So what the hell it is, I do not know. Um, I mean, they actually did come up with a storyline for it, which seems a bit ridiculous. Uh, so you've come back from ninja hamster school or whatever, and your village has been taken over by uh, these two, uh, I don't know, two villains anyway. And they have four of their lackeys. You've got to defeat them all. And, and, and there you go. Um, each round lasts an absolute age because the instant you take a hit or you hit uh, the opponent, uh, the health bars start regenerating. So if you if you hit if you hit him once, um, within like a couple of seconds, it's as if you hadn't done anything. If you if you're not doing too good, you decide right. I'll just jump away for a bit to replenish my health. Of course, his health is all, re all replenishing at the same time. So you're effectively right back at the beginning again. It's as if you hadn't done anything. So one round can last an eternity. Am I right in thinking, um, is, there no, is there not actually any... Uh, you, don't, you can't knock them over or anything, can you? No, there's nothing, nothing like that. No, um, no, no. There's only about three or four attacking moves in the entire game. Um... And when you actually finally do uh, manage to beat him, and as always, it's the one move will, uh, you know, just defeat, just keep using the same move over and over again, and you'll just defeat him like that. 
that's when you realise that uh, unlike most of these sort of one-on-one -on -one fighting games where it's usually a best of three, no, not this one. No, it's not. It's not best of three. It's not best of five. It's not best of nine. It's the best of thirteen. You have to beat him seven times before you actually get on to the next opponent. So it drags on for I haven't got a, no, I don't know how long. You've got no idea if any of your hits are actually connecting because the only audio in the game at all is this pretty forgettable music. It's not the worst music I've ever heard, but I, I would never actually say it's good. What is the purpose of the apple? There's an apple. Well, that's, that's um, telling you how many uh, rounds you've won. Each time you beat, uh, you beat the opponent, one bite gets taken out of their apple. Ah, see, and once, right. you, once you've taken seven bites out, seven bites out of it, then you actually finally move on to the next opponent. And is the, the next opponent, did you actually make it that far? Um, yeah, actually, I do a couple of times in this, but I've never oh, got past uh, level two. It's just, um, I just looked at, if you, yeah, if you jump to, where are you, 1137, it looks like you're fighting, it looks like a cross between one of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and a, uh, oh, yeah, an so alligator. It, yeah. it also looks like one of the, the sort of the Super Mario... Well, it's one of the baddies in Super Mario. Yeah, yeah, but, one of them. I, I, what, I couldn't what, put a lot. What annoys me about this game personally is the fact that the the you need to either stick to coloured expanded sprites or else high res monochrome graphics, and they've kind of gone for a bit of both. Yeah, yeah and um, I mean the part that irritates me the most about the graphics is the fact that they are completely transparent. So when you walk across them, it, it is just this black mass. You can't make out anything at all. <laughs> and this was released in 1987. Uh, uh, yeah, 87. Which was full like price game. Two years after We Have the Exploding Fist, and two years after yeah. probably International Karate Plus. Yeah. See, again, in I mean, in uh, the video, I kept choosing all all the wrong sort of game types. Uh, again, I was saying, oh, Impossible Mission, and uh, I, I think I mentioned Whizball. But I should have pointed out, yeah, yeah, International Karate, Way of the Exploding Fist, IK Plus was uh, out before this. So, you know, and all of these were great um, fighting games. So you throw in Barbarian, it's not martial arts, but, you know, still one-on-one -on -one fighting. And this game was exactly the same price, released a year later, and, and yet the CRL thought this was, well, not only worth releasing, but it would actually sell. I mean... Uh, they were just taking the piss, I think. And was this was this full price? Yeah. Yeah, it was full price. Ten quid for yeah, this thing. Yeah. <laughs> All right, just, I mean, unsurprisingly, just... it got absolutely annihilated in every review, and deservedly so. I mean, I know yeah. there are some some magazines like Zap in particular. They had some rather dubious scores for some games, but yeah, this one, this one got the. It got the full treatment it deserved. Roasted to life, yeah, absolutely. It's just... Uh, if it had been released as a budget game, maybe two years earlier, yeah, they'd probably say, well, you might get five, ten minutes of fun, but... Yeah. It's, you know, to release that as a full price game is just... Uh, yeah. <laughs> as you say, that the, the fact that when you see the baddies fighting, it's just a complete mess. It's just... You can't, yeah. You can't distinguish. Yeah. The thing is, the actual... I like I like the detail in the bodies. Now, if they could have used if they could have used the detail, it's very reminiscent of um, like Green Beret and the Spectrum. Really nice graphics, but you know, it just doesn't suit. A fighting games should be very visual, big graphics, color. Yeah, graphics, that, that, that's it. I mean, it, it. It could work on some uh, game types, I guess. Although, again, I'm I'm. Seeing this sort of graphic style on a Commodore 64 for any game doesn't really sit well with me. Um, but to use it for a, a you know one-on-one -on -one fighting game like this, I mean, it's probably the worst decision I think I've ever seen when it comes to game design. Could you actually have imagined anybody playing this even back in the day for any more than a couple of minutes? I, I, I could. I, I say exactly that in the uh, in the review vid. You know. If, if you were stupid enough to buy this back in the day, I, I doubt you would have made it to the end of your first go before you turned it off and never looked at it again. <laughs> I hope you kept your receipt. 
Yeah, <laughs> enough, enough said. That is why that occupies number four in our worst ever games. Number three, we're completely moving away from fighting games and we're on a game called uh, Snooker by Vision Software on the Commodore 64. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring it up on my channel. I did do a look at. Now, this was one of the sort of earliest games that I got for my uh, for my C64. I was a big fan of snooker back in the 80s. Everybody was playing snooker. And the fact that I could play this game on my computer was like a revelation. I think there was a couple of arcade games that kind of, you could play pool and that kind of thing. I thought, this looks awesome. You know, so I bought this and what makes, you know, when you load it up, it looks fine. Yeah, it looks okay. It's, it's basic. Again, if you look at this, I don't know if you've got it on your screen there, Chris. Yeah, I got it, yeah. You see there, the snooker table itself occupies about the 51% of the screen. It's uh, yeah, just about, yes. Yeah. Now, firstly, that would be, if I, if I was playing snooker and they put the balls down like that, I would want a re because the reds are not actually touching. <laughs> uh, you know, um... <laughs> And uh, anyway, yeah, you'll see there as well, the balls aren't actually, uh, they're not actually round, they're more, I don't know what you'd call that. I almost look hexagonal to me, you know. <laughs> now, I know we're being, we're, being a bit, we're being a bit picky. Now, this game did not, you could not play, it says number of players zero, one or two. Now, presumably zero was a, a demo. It must be a yeah. demo mode, yeah. Or a one-player game, or a two-player game. Now, one-player game, you basically, I know this sounds wrong, you got to play with yourself. You could not, there was no, there was no AI built into the game at that point. Now, that's not the reason this game is on this list. The reason is, is about to become apparent when you actually come to play the shot. It's got one of the most annoying sound effects ever in a game. To do the power, you line up, you've got the cross here, which you line up, which is fine. You use the joystick to line it up. You then hold the fire button down and you'll see the power moves up. And then you, at what point you want to... Uh... <laughs> so I'm just laughing at the break there. You let, you let the fire button go and the ball, the, you know, it, it hits the balls. Now, I don't know whether the fact that the animation of the balls was so jerky... Was it to do with the processing power of the, the, the chip? I'm not quite sure. Well, I, I, I think this game was written in BASIC. Uh, so, I mean, because there's no sprites here or anything, is it? It's, it's a combination of uh, uh, ASCII um, <laughs> graphics on the, the balls and the table. And I think there's a UDG for the, you know, the, the, the matchstick men down there. But... But that's it. So I'm pretty sure the game is in basic. It does look like that, or it might be one of these things where it was run in basic, and then it was it was run through a sort of a a, a, a machine code thing. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but yeah, the the thing that made this game fundamentally unplayable was the physics were wholly unrealistic. It, you know, you could line up a shot, and it would simply not work the way it should. Um, so there was that, but what I'm going to do is try and uh, try and fast forward to a bit in the video if I can find it. The actual aim, the aiming mechanism was utterly, utterly broken. Now let me see if I can find it in my video. Uh, yeah, if you fast forward to, let's see, if you fast forward to about 8.24 in the video. 8.24. Right. Yeah, if you get to about 8.24, there you yeah, okay, yeah, I'm there. You'll see I'm lining up a pot in the bottom right hand corner. Yeah. And you'll see it's lined up perfectly and yet I missed uh, it. <laughs> now what I do is completely missed it. I then zoom in. If you just fast forward I actually z <laughs> it's awful. I zoom in on the ball. Yeah, here, yeah, it's just coming it up. Completely it's lined up and the ball just <laughs> completely misses it. I'd say it almost looks like uh, the cue ball has hit uh, the red and bounced off that while the red's got like, glued to the table there. <laughs> and another fantastic thing is, I don't think I demonstrate it in this particular video, It's I think the, I think the ball, the pockets were magnets and the balls are made of metal because sometimes if you actually went near a pocket it would just like soak, 
it's like that bit in Marble Madness. You've got these vacuums that suit Yeah, them. that's it. Yeah, it they appear. Yeah, in you in. go. So I absolutely wanted this game to be the best thing ever, and unfortunately, it just I couldn't play it. I couldn't play, it and I ended up going back to back to Hustler on the C sixty four. It was just the 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 not wrong with the graphics, but the physics were completely broken, and it just crushed any enthusiasm I had for that game. Yeah. Um, and that's why, and when when it's a game all about physics, when the physics are as wrong and broken as they are in this game, forget it. It's uh, I'm out with a white flag. And that is why Snooker by Vision Software is number three in our list. Two to go, guys. And in number number two, second worst game ever. It's one of my favourite worst games, and it's uh, Greenberry on the Commodore uh, C sixteen. I believe plus four. I love this game to bits. Now, when you start, I don't know if you found the video, Chris. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. I'm, we got we're sport for choice with this one. We uh, we both covered this. There are so okay. many. There are so many now. It's got. This game has got the the mo- I wonder how long it took them to actually uh, design the the opening credits. When you load the game, it doesn't come up with the name of the game. It comes up stab to start, and it's not even a. They've not even gone to the bother of trying to create their uh, own font. It's just, yeah, still uh, using system font. System font stab to start. That's 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 basically the best part of the game you've just witnessed. You then get into the game itself, and what unravels itself is just absolutely hilarious. Except if you'd spent, I don't know what it was called. I mean, this was this game was, <coughs> excuse me, this game was a commercial release. The, the thing is, this game was a. It was released by Imagine Software. It was part of the the Ocean label, and it is one of probably the best games on the spectrum. Jonathan Smith done the Spectrum version. It's a fantastic game. The C64 one again is a great game. It's got a cra- absolutely cracking soundtrack by Martin Galway. But this version is wrong in so many ways. It's I, I, uh, yeah. Where, where where do you start with it? I mean, you love yeah. It's it glitches when you run from left to right. It just glitches all over the place. I don't know. I don't know much about. I know um, I did do a live stream of this game um, a couple of weeks ago. Apparently, the C sixteen and the, the Commodore Plus Four it didn't have sprites. Oh, that's right. Yeah, there yeah, were no hard But it looks more like a Spectrum game. Then, when you get to the edge of the screen, instead of scrolling smoothly like the C sixty four did, the whole everything just stops. Like it stops. So even if somebody's about to kill you, everything stops. And it just shifts the screen along from left to right. Um, I don't even know where to start. It's just, it's outrageous. As soon as you die, you instantly appear at the left-hand side. And before you've even had time to react, you're dead again. It's just, <laughs> it's awful. Yeah. I mean, we don't actually have I mean, to even talk. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those games where, you know, as soon as you see it, you can't help but laugh at it. You're not laughing with it. You are laughing at it. Um... But you, you then realise that there were people out there at the, at the time. Again, this is another full price game, so they paid ten quid. But there wasn't a huge number of games for the Commodore 16, so you know it, when these people thought, "Oh yeah, we're we're getting Green Beret for for this. We we've, we've got to buy that. This is a day one purchase. This." <laughs> And this is what they get. I mean, you look at the the sprites. All of the sprites are identical. It's just that yours happens to be a different colour to to everyone else. But you you look at him and and you look at his arm there, where it looks like his his elbow is just above the wrist. And again, if his arm was was arms were down by his side, they'd be dragging along the floor. So it's it's just awfully drawn. Um, I mean, even though there were no hardware sprites on the Commodore 16, I'm sure it didn't need this big sort of like uh, block around him every time he walks in the or walks in front of something like you know the the bridge supports. Um, and it appears that you, you seem to you seem to die for no apparent reason sometimes. 
the bullets that they fire are they just come at you, come at you so fast. Yeah, you they, you've you got no time to react. Reacting. As soon as you die, you're instantly flung back into mayhem, and you're you're dead again. I mean, I, yeah. yeah, we've been watching this for a couple of minutes, and I don't know how many games I've actually gone through in it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Even it, 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 I don't know if this was written in basic. I, I I'm considering this was you know imagine it's part of Ocean Software. I mean, they were the biggest uh, you know publishers of the day. By Ocean, so I. Mean, I under the ocean banner, so they're a massive, they're a massive company at that point. Yeah, so I, I can't believe this is written in basic. They would never have got away with that. So, so this has to be an actual coded. Was it, was it a six five zero two processor that I, the I really don't know. sixteen had? Um, I, I just, I, I cannot believe that this was the best they could do. I, it's, it's just. It's one of the most grotesque <laughs> games I've ever seen. It's, I mean, it's, yeah. it's almost like instead of actually, in, in, instead of actually saying, "Look, guys, I, I know you've given it our best, but really, is, that, is this the best we can come up with?" Right, I think we'll need to shelve this. Somebody's yeah. obviously thought, "Listen, guys, just punt it out. Nobody's going to notice. These guys have got hee-haw games to play for their system. They'll they'll lap it up." You you know you you look at your mate's Spectrum version or C sixty four version and you load this you just you'd feel like you'd been just robbed stupid. Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, um. <laughs> it's hilarious. I suggest if you've never played the game, please play it. You can play it for free on an emulator, and you'll just realise the next time you're going to complain about Flappy Bird or whatever. This is what we had to play. Well, that's what your uh, your C sixty four. That's what your C sixteen <laughs> and and plus four. Are. Does it mean you think people who bought the plus four? That thing was more expensive than the Commodore sixty four when it came out. And this is what you got if you decided, oh, I'll and, I'll buy a game for it. And and when you when you die, part of your your sprite still remains on screen. It's just it's it's an absolutely hideous. If if you saw this and somebody said this is this is 33% draft or beta, you go, right, fair enough, I can see what you're doing here, guys. Graphics look all right, mm, they're, all, all, they're all the same colour, it's just outlines, there's no colour. Graphics are a bit kind of bland looking, but, you know, I'm sure once you've worked on the scrolling, etc., it'll be all right. Uh, it's almost like somebody forgotten, it's like, again, they're sitting in the meeting at the end, right? Spectrum, yep, yeah, fantastic, ready to go, C64, C16. Wait a minute, boss. You you took me off that about three months ago when it was only at twelve percent. Listen, nobody'll notice. Just stick it out. <laughs> Just stick it out. Like it is. Let's punt it out as is. I might. I'm actually tempted to try and uh, to play through this. I don't know if there's any cheats for this game. I'm actually tempted to try and play through it with cheat modes just to see if I actually. Oh, <laughs> uh, I, I I couldn't even begin to try and do that. I mean. <laughs> Uh, how long did I play? I played it for not even eleven minutes in me uh, in my video, and that was more than enough. I just couldn't stomach any more of it. Uh, <laughs> I managed. I managed twelve twelve minutes and twenty six. So I was always a bit a bit more resilient than you were. But anyway, yeah, yeah, you've obviously got far more patience than me there. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, if you want to see pro possibly one of the worst games ever, then you need to do that. So that was number two. Now, we've debated long and hard as to what could be one of the worst games ever. I think we could, I think it's pretty pretty much safe to say that probably any games in the top eight could have quite easily have uh, picked up the, the mantle as the worst game ever. But the game we've plumped for is, and I'll try and not get it wrong because I kept saying the wrong name, Auf Wiedersehen Pet on the C64 now before we start what we're going to do is both open it up so this game I don't know did we actually establish who was it written by the same crowd at Diddy Stenders uh, no this was by Bob Carr and it was released by uh, was it T-Soft uh, the same people who did the uh, uh, game oh Tynesoft there it is uh, it came out in 84 so it came out the same year as impossible mission as uh yep. pit stop 2 Fine. as uh yeah. just imagine impossible mission 
think of how silky smooth the graphics were, how wonderful the speech was. Everything about that game. Raid over Moscow, stunning animation. And then this game came. I've got to say, the, 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 you know, the title screen, the, there's been a bit of thought going into the Wiedersehen part. That's actually quite nice. They've, they've not taken the easy option out and used the, uh, the built-in font. Now, you well, they do for the rest of it. <laughs> yeah, well, the game's not actually started. Um, let's see. I'm just starting to actually see where the... Here we go. Right, if we get to seven minutes... You've got to go way into it, yeah. Yeah, you get to about six. Follow the... So here we go. Right, this, this is... In the first part of his adventure, Oz must lay bricks as quickly as possible. The more bricks, the more points, but standing in his way are queer-looking Eric's. <laughs> Should he knock into one of them or lay a brick where there isn't one underneath, then Achtung on your bike. Keep an eye out for tumbling trowels as well. So there you go. There's a little depiction of an Eric. You've got lager, you've got table, you've got a barmaid. Right, okay. Is this actually going to take us into the game? I think you've skipped a, a little oh, bit did of I, it. Did I uh, jump? If you go go to um, about nine minutes. Nine minutes. Okay, right, there we go, right. Right, there we so are. You got the, uh, you got the controls uh, on display there, and here we are. <laughs> I mean, look at that. That, I mean, what? <laughs> that is like a type-in game. Presumably, you are the little, the little tiny, minute character. Yeah, the tiny matchstick yeah. man. That is supposedly there, yeah. uh, Jimmy Neal, or whatever he was called, Oz, in the, the TV program. And laying bricks, so you're walking left to right. And that is you actually laying the bricks. So what, what I'm trying to remember, what was was it literally moving left and right and that automatically laid the yeah, bricks? Yeah, the bricks automatically got laid as soon as you as Move. you moved. And uh they you had to lay them on top of each other. You you couldn't so if you uh say if you moved upwards, if you then moved left or right and there was nothing underneath you, then that would be well you lost a life. Actually no, you didn't lose a life. That level then ended, you just went straight on to the next level. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, if you, if you, you, you always so you had to be walking on um, a layer of bricks beneath you. If you fell down, then that was you know again the uh, the the well, say you didn't lose a life. The, the level ended. Uh, also, the, I mean, the music when the level starts, it sounds staggeringly basic anyway. But um, if something's moving on screen, it couldn't move anything on screen and play the music at the same time. <laughs> so it had to alternate between moving and then playing the next note. It, oh. So that was, it, it was obviously, it must have been written in basic, eh? It must have been. Oh, it's it's got to be, yeah. It must have been written in basic because all the graphics, I mean, I'm now on, where am I here? I'm on 1052. 1052, and it looks like some sort of, Bar oh, it's just, yeah, it's it's, it's but, doing the uh, the display for uh, I think that's meant to be the Dusseldorf skyline. Yeah, that's the yeah, well, there you I've go. Been, I've been to Dusseldorf and the skyline. Does it, does it, does it look like that? Uh, shockingly, no. Okay, I was going to They're say I'll be going there anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that it even has to draw, it takes five minutes to draw that. It was ob it was obviously written in basic. And yet well, is... the, the, the time it takes to draw that level um, is lightning fast compared to uh, the final level. Because there's only three levels in it. Um, the the final level, the you killer. are you're in the pub. Well, the beer keller, yeah. This is the second one, the second level. The third level is when you you try and find your way back to you know the digs or whatever <laughs> after being out on the piss all night, and um, that one, in order for it to draw the level, uh, you are sitting there waiting for longer than if you were playing, I don't know, three or four of this, this actual game. You know, if you could skip the build up to that, you would be able to easily play this game three, four, five times in the time it takes just to draw that one bit. 
So that is the final I... level. Ah, is this... Yeah, right. Oh, is this... A... Oh, it's got a car part on it. Uh, no, you're not actually driving. No, that's that's just... Uh... Ah, right. There's static graphics. Yeah. I was thinking this is looking... This looks a bit like Turbo by Sega. But this actually looks quite promising, right? So Oz is tired and wants to go home to the sanctuary of, of Hut 1, Stalag 13. Right, okay, right so here we go. So this is the build up to uh, level three. Um, so yeah, it, it comes up there. Wait and watch. Believe me, you are waiting a long, long time. So you notice uh, as it got to the part where it's drawing it there. I've got a bit where it's got like the the, the hut at the top and it's put all these random sprites of cars. Right. Okay. Yeah. Now you see all of the uh, the lamp posts yeah. there. Every single one of those lampposts goes out and it blacks out part of the screen. Um, and it does it literally one square at a time. And you have to wait for that entire screen to have been filled in black at the rate at which, well, it, it's going now. It never speeds up. It's, it's like this. I mean, by the time it finally finishes, you have long since stopped caring what the uh, layout was. Because you have to avoid the lampposts, avoid the cars, and get to the uh, the hut there. So You just don't care. Let me get this right. So we've got to sit through and wait for the entire screen to black out. And you've yeah. got to try and move, navigate by memory. Is that kind of what we're yeah, doing that, that, Yeah, that's it. You got it. I mean, it's... It's. <laughs> you know what? If this had been, if this had been a type in game back in nineteen eighty one, you'd have been. You'd have thought, why did I waste? Yeah. Much it, time doing this. Yeah. The fact that this got a commercial release is just. It's it's um the fact they got a commercial release at any time. But I'll say this came out the same year as Impossible Mission, as uh, you know, Pit Stop Two, as Summer Games, as Raid Over Moscow. Uh, it, it's, it's. Well, I would say it's a joke, but uh, I mean, it, it goes way beyond that. It's staggering. It'd be like it'd be a bit like going to McDonald's and you buy a, a Big Mac and you open up the box and there is nothing in it. Yeah. Oh, well, fair enough. You know, whatever. <laughs> I don't think I actually... this, this this was written by Bob Carr, and what I didn't know um, at the time, but uh, someone mentioned it in uh, the comments on my video. Bob Carr is also the man who is responsible for one of the most infamous of uh, Commodore 64 games. Uh, he's the bloke who uh, created Stroker. Stroker, that sounds a bit wrong, but anyway, what, what's that one about? Uh, uh, do you really want me to no, explain? Okay. It? Uh, it's, uh, it's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. That is, uh, if Bob's watching this, then feel free to come on our channel and redeem yourself. Um, uh, if Bob is watching this, I strongly suggest he doesn't watch my video of this game. Uh, <laughs> this game fueled one of the most hate filled rants I've ever recorded. I mean, at one point, um, the recording just goes completely tits up and uh, it's just recording a blank screen and I'm just ranting away for about six or seven minutes. Uh, I, I've just, I mean, okay, I've reviewed plenty of crap games in my time, but, and there are some which have really annoyed me because of how bad they are. But none of them have generated such genuine levels of out-and-out -out hatred as this thing did while I was uh, reviewing this. There is, I, this. there is absolutely nothing to redeem itself. Every, I mean, the, the actual levels themselves are just diabolical. The, the game design are diabolical. The graphics are just like the worst ever. Yeah, I mean, there, yeah. Th there are genuinely... Games that are on uh, the Cascade Cassette 50, which are far better yeah. than this. And of course, with the Cassette 50, that, the games average out to being 20p each. 
and a lot of them are still a rip off at 20p this was i think eight quid and you just know that there is someone out there who actually paid that who actually spent eight quid for this it's just, it's how many levels in total were there, uh, Chris? Was it just the three? Oh, it's just the three, and it just presu- keeps repeating. Presumably it loops after you... Uh, yeah, yeah. If you've not already uh, <laughs> passed out through, yeah, just fury, we absolutely playing this. Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, I think we've seen enough. I think we've seen enough of that one. So that is going to be our worst video game ever. I dare say anyone watching this is probably going to have their own top 20. If we made this this list again tomorrow, I dare see other games would feature in this. But yeah, think... there have been plenty of changes. I think, though, the number one would stay the <laughs> same regardless. Absolutely, absolutely. So anyway, guys, listen, um, I hope you enjoyed watching... Uh, sorry, enjoyed... Maybe that's possibly the wrong, uh, the wrong word. Yeah, I don't know if that's the right word, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, as I say, us, we have suffered for your pleasure. So, anyway, listen, um, thanks to Chris for joining me in a video. Um, if, All right. if we get enough nice comments and you want to see more, Chris and I will maybe get together again and do something top 10 broken games, something like that. So, anyway, guys, thank you very much for watching. Take it easy. Take care. All right. All right. Cheers.